The September 19th meeting of the Scarborough Planning Board will come to order. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, in the absence of uh, Doreen tonight, uh, Autumn is uh, responsible for calling the roll. Autumn. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Rick Monkey. Here. Roger Bailey. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Richard Dupree. Here. Chad Reed. Here. And Karen Shoup is absent. Uh, next item on the agenda, the approval of the minutes of August 29th. Uh, before I call for a motion, are there any uh, corrections or additions? Hearing none, can I have a motion of approval? So moved. Thank you, and a second? Second. Thank you. Could you please call for the vote? Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Rick Meinke? Yes. Roger Bailey? Yes. Jen Ladd? Yes. Rick Dupree? Yes. And Chad Reed? Uh, Chad is not a voting member tonight. Uh, the board is, all, all voting board members are present. Next item on the agenda, the planning board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on amendments to chapter 405C shoreland zoning ordinance. The proposed amendments relate to height requirements for non-conforming structures that are located in areas of special flood hazard. Eric. Thank you. So this public hearing uh, is concerning some proposed changes to the town's shoreland zoning ordinance, chapter 405C. Um, there's been a shortfall on the mandatory shoreland zoning uh, ordinance that has dealt with non-conforming structures within 75 feet of a resource. Um, for those structures, they are limited in height to 20 feet or the existing height of the structure, whichever is greater. Um, uh, if those are improved in any way that uh, improve the market value by 50% uh, or greater, um, then they would need, to, they are subject to a um, uh, requirement to elevate the structures. Um, the ordinance never really took into account that requirement. So the height requirement remained the same, even though uh, with the, exp uh, the expansion of those non-conforming structures, they would have needed to be elevated by three to five feet. Um, so instead of making property owners either remove a level of their house or flatten roof lines, the legislature voted to allow uh, such renovations and use measurements that take into account uh, the additional three to five feet that would be required for those improvements. Uh, there's also language requiring applicants to submit photographs of uh, the work before and after the project is completed. Um, the town council held its first reading of the proposed amendments, uh, I believe on the September 7th, about a week and a half ago, um, and referred it to the planning board for a hearing. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to the board. Thank you. Uh, am I correct in assuming that uh, this change really is at the, the behest of changes in the legislation? That's correct. So that would bring our ordinances into conformity with the legislation? Correct. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room who would like to make a comment? Now is the time. Please approach the podium. State your name and address. Uh, Autumn, is there anyone online Unfortunately, unable to link into the meeting. Eric, do you I, see anyone? I don't see anybody online raising their hand. Oops. No. Um, the public portion, uh, public comment portion of this hearing is closed. Uh, I'll turn it over to anybody on the board who would like to make a comment. Yeah, I'm going to ask a stupid question to better understand this because. Um, is the ordinance, Eric, limiting the height or allowing for? So it would it would allow property owners, and this only applies to non-conforming structures uh, within the uh, 75 feet of the resource that's protected under the shoreland zone. 
Um, so for those properties that are non-conforming and expand beyond that 50% mark, they would then be able to um, be either um, over 20 feet or the previous height, which they were um, prior to the expansion. So um, once they expand uh, with the uh, floodplain um, permitting requirements, they need to elevate above that, um, which is usually about a three to five foot elevation change. So um, it would allow over 20 feet for those particular properties that are renovated. Okay. But I think everything else in the shoreland zone has a height requirement of a maximum of 35 feet. So that, that stays unchanged. Yeah, I knew that our height requirement is 35 feet. I think part of that's driven by the ladder truck, but I was trying to better understand. It appeared that we were allowing them to raise the height of their roof line, which I'm fine with. I thought that makes sense. I'm not 100% sure why we limited it in the first place. So I'm good. Thanks for helping with that. Thank you. Uh, hearing nothing further, um, Eric, would you make sure that uh, council is surprised of the discussion and the hearing? And the hearing is now closed. I was something I wanted to do at the beginning and I forgot to do that. And that's simply to remind folks that our next hearing is on a Tuesday. The October 10th is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, and so therefore the here the, our meeting or our hearing takes place the next day on a Tuesday. Thank you. Item number six, AR building requests a site plan review to establish 10 multifamily structures on a 57 acre parcel located at 35 Mussey Road, assessors map R38, lot one. Eric. Thank you. So as Rachel mentioned, AR building uh, is looking for development of 120 multifamily units uh, on a parcel at the intersection of Gorham and Muzzy Roads. Uh, the project would include 10 three-story buildings and a one-story clubhouse uh, with a mix of one and two bedroom market rate units. Uh, at its August 8th meeting, the board reviewed the site plan and offsite transportation improvements and staff has been working with the AR building team on those since then, um, which along with its main DEP permit are still being finalized. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to the board. Thank you, and for the applicant. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Mitchell, Vice President of Development at AR Building Company. Um, just wanna thank you for your time tonight. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to share our project. Um, online, we have um, Pam Abar with um, Deprete Engineering, and she can um, go ahead and pull up our site plan. And then I'm also here with Nikki Conan with Sebago Technics. Um, she can talk about any and, uh, traffic questions that you might have. Um, so as Eric mentioned, um, over the last month or so, we have been going through the comments that um, staff has provided. Um, and I think we have worked to address all of those with staff. Um, once, the, once Pam brings up the, the site plan, um, we can, have Pam quickly take you through that. Um, but really, our plan really hasn't changed much since we last met with you. So I'm happy to take you through the plan if that's helpful, or we can just address any questions that you might have. Just hit the high points, if you sure would. Sure thing, yeah. Hi, good evening, this is Pam. Um, I'm having a little bit of difficulty sharing my screen right now. I'm not sure what's going on. See if I can uh, allow you to share. Try that. And if you're having difficulty, just so you know, we've got to, we've got a substitute for Doreen in the taking care of this. Yeah, it's not allowing me to share my screen. Not sure. My apologies for that. Okay, we're just going to bring up the uh, plan sets. Thank you. Just need one minute to pull those up on the screen.
How's that? That's great, Eric. Thank you. Yep. So as you can see there, right there on the, the site plan, um, our project is located at the corner of Mussey and Gorham Roads. Um, we are proposing 12, um, sorry, 10 12 unit buildings with a mix of one and two bedrooms. Um, some of the things that we've talked about with this board in the past is how do we kind of make it fit within that village feel with the TVC zoning. Um, so some of the things that we've added through our conversations is multiple connections down to the streets from the buildings. Um, the buildings are two-sided. Um, they have a feel uh, entrance-like feel both from the street, but also from the parking lots as well. Um, the clubhouse there is centered at the corner, um, which includes not only our management office, but fitness room and clubhouse um, community realm as well as the pool. Um, I think if you go to one of the other plans, you can also start to see that some of the landscaping that we put um, in and around the buildings just to kind of really emphasize that um, that street view along Mussey and Gorham Road, um, but also kind of adding a bit of privacy um, to the clubhouse and pool um, like we discussed with the board last time. Um, some of the other things that I think the board had comments about was the lighting. Um, so since last meeting, we have fixed that to meet your standards. And then um, some of the remaining questions that we had out there um, from the planning report that we saw from Eric was that um, you asked a little bit about the timing of our offsite improvements. Um, so we plan to do those ahead of the Downs project and to make sure that we're coordinating the timing of our pedestrian access so it doesn't, so what we're building isn't ripped up by the Downs moving in the future. So we'll, we'll make sure that's coordinated and we're planning on doing that next year. Um, some of the other questions was about the site plan um, elements, the dumpster area particularly. Um, so we typically do that as a design build. Um, it will be a mix of CMU block, um, brick, um, and fencing to make sure that, it, that it's enclosed. Um, another question um, that was in the staff report was about um, addressing. Um, so I have worked with the town um, and come up with two names um, that that hasn't been used anywhere else in the town. Um, so we've, we've established those. Um, one is none such river lane, I believe. And the other one is winter but green lane. Um, the other question was about the offsite pedestrian improvements and Nikki has worked with the, the town's consultants to kind of figure all of those out and we've been working with them. If you have any specific questions about it, Nikki can certainly come up and kind of walk you through those. And then um, I think the other two questions were about our state approvals. Um, so we do not have our DEP um, approvals quite yet, um, but we are addressing the DP's last two comments and we expect those um, very, very soon. And then the last other thing was to have um, Wilson letters from the Water and Sewer Authority, and we do have those. Um, and we will, of course, work with them to get a full permit before construction. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, this is an item that is available for public comment. Is there anyone in the room that would like to make a comment? Anyone online with a hand raised? No? One person, Madam Chair. All right. Um, uh, let me promote them. All right, Denise, you should be able to speak. Hi, Denise Hamilton, 167 Two Rod Road. Um, the applicant had mentioned that these um, units would be a mix of one and two bedrooms. Has it been indicated how many of each? Because I'm concerned as to if there's been any consideration how this could affect eight corners elementary school, if there's any K through two um, children in those units and the school being uh, beyond capacity already. Thank you. 
uh, for the applicant. Could you uh, give us the numbers, please? Yes, I certainly can. Um, so we are proposing a 50-50 mix. So 60 um, units would be one bedroom, 60 units would be two bedrooms. And I can say from, um, you know, looking at our projects, um, we have a portfolio of over 9,000 units. Um, our projects don't typically attract um families with school age children. Um, we don't have um, the playground facilities that usually brings in families. Um, we have done a, um, a review of all of our properties because we do get this, um, this question from the town many times. And what we found out of, uh, you know, for every unit, there's maybe 0.03 um, students that would um, be in, sorry, students of school age, um, school age children that would be in one of our developments. Um, so it's definitely not something we typically find. Most of our residents are, you know, either young um, professionals who either are not ready to own a home or don't want to own a home. And then the other kind of mix that we find in our residents is older um, people from the neighborhood who still want to live in the area, but that don't necessarily want to live in in the home anymore. Thank you. Eric, do we have anyone else? Not seeing anybody online. All right, thank you. In that case, hearing is closed and I will turn this over to the board for questions. Let's start down at the end. Rick Meinking. Um we've seen this many times now. I think this is the third time and um I think all my questions and my concerns that I had early on with the project have been um, adequately uh, addressed, and um, I don't I don't really have anything to add to the conversation here. I think uh, they're they're meeting the uh, the ordinances as as we request our applicants to, and uh, therefore um, I just don't have any issue. Thank you, Jen. Um, I do have a couple of questions. In the material that you submitted, um, you referred to, to and our, tra our traffic peer reviewer picked up as well, um, some comments about the pedestrian uh, analysis of the signal timing and the pedestrian phase as it was included or excluded from that. Um, but I didn't see on any of the plans, and it, if I have missed this and someone could point it out to me, that would be great. Um, but I didn't see anywhere on the plans where any infrastructure was shown as part of any of those signalized intersections. And so um, there's, uh, so that's one thing. And then if, if that is because um, I don't have the individual improvements committed to memory yet that um, our friends at the Downs are going to be doing in a lot of places, but if that infrastructure represents the pedestrian improvements at either of these signalized intersections. I think it would be really helpful for the plans to show that even if they're grayed out and, and um, labeled as by others or something like that, just so that there is a more, um, a little more context to how this does fit into the neighborhood as you spoke to um, before. But like for, for example, the corner of um, Gorham and Muzzy, Muzzy Road doesn't show um, any ramps or crosswalks at that intersection. And so I was just wondering if that was um, uh, by design or not. So um, we do have some diagrams of those offsite um, improvements that we're doing. Nikki, do you mind walking the board through that? Thanks. Eric, do you have those? Can you pull them up? Sorry, I'm just copying them over to the council uh, chamber's material.
Any particular diagram you want to see first? Uh, let's go to the first one at Gorham and Muzzy. I'm Nikki Cohn at Woods Tobago Technics, by the way. Um, and I, if you go down to the next sheet, yeah. So basically there aren't pedestrian accommodations at the intersection currently, and the Downs is also not proposing to do any pedestrian accommodations. So everything that you see here is associated to our project. Um, at all of the crossings, there should be landings with detectable warning fields and ramps. Um, it is a little hard to tell at this scale, but there are um, pedestal poles with push buttons and uh, pedestrian signal heads. In some instances, they're mounted to the existing strain poles. Um, in other instances, there's actual new pedestal poles, but we'll work through all the final placement and conduit runs and all of that to make sure everything's ADA compliant and final design. So is there a reason that those aren't on the site plans as well? They they can be, yeah. Um, yeah, this got submitted as a separate response to the, the traffic comments, but if the board would like to see this on the site plan, we're more than happy to coordinate that effort. I, I think because we did have some comments earlier on, we've sort of been talking about it um, a number of times. I, I just, I do think it helps to kind of um, round out the yep. development and how you're fitting in with the rest of the um, the zone and the, the neighborhood. And um, I think it's great that these are being added and it would be um, great to show, to tell the whole story on your plan. Um, so thank you for pulling those up. Um, the other question I have, there were also some comments about um, citing the sidewalk, particularly along muzzy roads, such that if a right turn lane were to be added here, it wouldn't uh, need to be disturbed or there would be sufficient room for that, which I think is great. And it does look like you've done that. Um, but I'm curious about why, um, why right at the corner, you're holding that so close, uh, so close to the curb line and the travel lane. Um, and I, I think it's great that in the along the other frontages of the development, you're able to hold that back a little bit to provide both some uh, esplanade and some buffer space to the roadways, but also for snow storage. Um, and so I was just curious why at the right at the corner, particularly if there's no ramp right there, um, why that's in that location and not held back a little bit further. Yep. Um, so originally the intent was, and if Eric, you scroll back up to the, the first sheet that does show, I believe the, what the right turn lane would look like. Um, so there is existing curb around that corner. So the intent was to put the sidewalk at the curb line, uh, and not interfere significantly with their frontage because the clubhouse is going there and they're trying to put landscaping and, and make that more of a focal point, but we can definitely work through um, if the board would prefer that be set back like the rest of the sidewalk. I, I wouldn't think that would have significant grading impacts to what's been proposed. Okay, I wasn't sure if it did. I don't think it's super steep right up there against the corner, but um, I think what the, what you're showing elsewhere on the site is great and it would be great to continue that around yep. that corner if there's um, sufficient room. Absolutely. Um, other than that, I'm fine with staff uh, working with the applicant down the road for um, specifics on the dumpster enclosure, and I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Roger? Um, I'm basically satisfied with everything, too, especially um, if you could address the um, comments my colleague has. Um, I do have a question, though, a technical question for um, Eric. On the uh, land trust letter, um, uh, we'll uh, that we'll we'll talk about that. Um, is that specific to this? Isn't it? Oh, it's not. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I, we'll, <laughs> we will address that under correspondence. Okay. I'm all set then. All right. Thank you, Rick. Rick DePerry. Yeah, I'm with the other Rick. We've seen this several times. I appreciate the applicant's willingness to accommodate the changes that we've asked for. You guys did a great job, and I think it's a good development. So I have no questions. Thank you. Chad. Yeah, likewise, uh, nothing further. 
All right. Uh, I have one uh, addition, uh, additional comment. Uh, just as a reminder, we did receive communications under public uh, opinion. Uh, we did receive communication from Dennis and Barbara Daugherty, Daugherty uh, concerning um, uh, our approving this. Uh, they were very uh, enthusiastic about the, the project. Um, I'm basically with the, the rest of the folks here. I just want to note that I'm, um, this is the very first time that I can recall um, the addressing authority requiring a second address through a parking lot. Uh, I, I don't know why, why they did that. Uh, we usually uh, get addresses of private lanes um, through a, a apartment complexes, I, it kind of threw me that they wanted a second uh, address um, in what is essentially a unified parking lot. And we've not done that before. Uh, that's up to them. I'm glad you've worked it out. It's just, for my way of thinking, it's just a little strange. Uh, the I'm gonna test the uh, the planning board here. We do not have yet a DEP permit. And there, I think that's uh, the major stumbling block right now. And we cannot prove something, uh, prove something without a DEP permit. Is it the uh, consensus of the planning board that at the point at which they get a DEP permit, um, they can return to us as a consent item, assuming they've worked with the staff to iron out any additional information that's required. Okay, um, as soon as you have that permit, work with the staff, make sure that you've dotted all your I's, crossed the T's, got everything completed, uh, and you will go on the agenda as a consent item. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, I appreciate it. Item number seven, Crossroads Holding LLC is requesting a subdivision amendment review for the Fifth Amendment subdivision of the Town Center Residential District to include a drainage easement and eight single family homes on lot 35. Property is further identified as Assessor's Map U55, lot 35. And now. Oh, was that was that you, Drew? And did you? It might have been. I'm out of Zoom now. I might right. hopefully. Right. Sorry. All right. Let let me try saying something. Okay, I'm not hearing myself again. So that that works. Eric, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this project was previous previously before the board back in August. Um, at its August 29th meeting, uh, the board generally inquired about uh, communal spaces uh, and some lighting uh, detailing. Uh, staff has remaining comments on smaller items such as addressing and some fire lane striping uh, and has prepared a draft motion for the project for the board's consideration. And with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it to the applicant. Thank you. Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer representing Crossroad Holdings, LLC. Um, we're in front of you for the, I believe it was the August 29th planning board. So I'm going to be real brief with a summary here and just provide some plan updates and uh, looking forward to a hopeful approval this evening for lot 35 and town center residential. Um, so overall plan, just to give a little bit of context here, uh, the dashed outline here is lot 35, front runner ways up in this location, pacer ways north of the site, and there's a private access drive that connects and provides access to this lot. Plan updates, um, as you can see, we're still proposing eight micro home units, same orientation, um, as well as 18 parking spaces. So I think two per single family unit with two extra visitor spaces. Um, so a couple of plan updates that are shown on this screen that weren't in your package that went in for this meeting. Um, working with uh, town staff and fire department and the trash collecting vendor, um, we've actually increased the 
um, private access drive in this portion to 20 feet of paved width. Um, that gets us down to where the hammerhead turnaround is proposed for the fire truck as well as the trash vendor. Um, so we've removed or eliminated the reinforced turf and mountable curb on either side, making it easier for all parties to get down to that location. Um, another item that was not in your packet that's been revised since was the trailhead uh, location that enters the project down at the south. So working with the town engineer, we've actually provided the access to the side of the access drive. Um, even though there's no snow storage proposed at this location, we understand that plowing can sometimes push snow even where it's not delineated. And so just an effort for that, we've moved it to the side so that to ensure that there's no snow plow piles um, prohibiting trail use in that location. Um, in addition, we provided three bollard lighting, which was included in your packet um, at each trailhead location and the sidewalk to the north of the site, as well as in the middle um, to provide some lighting for residents of the project, as well as um, some guidance for the trail goers that are going to be passing through the site. So key updates, um, comments that we've received to date. So as I mentioned, trash pickups has been reviewed and approved by the vendor. Um, so fire department access, we're providing a 20 foot clear width, not none, no fire lane, um, or, re, or excuse me, no reinforced turf for the fire lane. This is all paved locations um, per request. So we've made that revision. Um, private alley and drive width. So uh, this private alley that we're proposing is consistent or beyond what we've been doing in the downs and in the town to date. And I'm going to skip down to the next slide here. I'll go back to the other updates. So what I have highlighted here in red are private alleys that we provide just in town center residential uh, to date. Um, and I won't go through every single one of them, but essentially there's 20 foot, either 20 foot paved width or 16 foot paved width with reinforced turf. Uh, Hayloft Lane here, Daisy Cutter by my mouse there, um, Futurity Lane down here. There's an unnamed private access drive up the townhouses, as well as the one that was approved through the third amended town center residential subdivision, which is essentially the access drive provided to this site. Um, this location on the right here is a blow up of right south of Hayloft Apartments. So right in this area, um, located right off of Daisy Cutter. Um, and what I provided this for was it shows visitor parking spaces for single family residents along here. Um, it's at essentially the same width and design that we're proposing tonight for the private access drive. So I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that. Um, relative to the auto turn on the left is the fire um, fire truck auto turn showing the complete movements, which we've worked out to at this point. On the right shows a 16 foot vehicle, passenger vehicle, which is our design vehicle for the site maneuvering the parking lot. Um, I know there was a request for the drive aisle and I just wanna point out that uh, while this isn't a formal parking lot drive aisle, we understand what, um, that the town has recommended that this become a waiver um, reducing it from the typical 25 feet to 20 feet for our project. Um, so we are fine requesting that as a formal waiver. We just want to provide kind of the movements and show that the, the design vehicle for the site is it's, it's meant to be tight. It's meant to be um, um, feel like a small residential given the, given the size of the units that we're proposing here. So I just mentioned that, but we will formally request a waiver if it's required. Um, and I did mention previously the bollard lighting as well as the trail signage has been provided. So in addition to the bollards at each end of the where the trail connects in, uh, we're providing wayfinding signs that will work out the details with um, directing the trail goers to north or south end of the site. Um, and in addition, I'll let Crossroads discuss this if they want to, uh, but the, they've, meet, they've scheduled a meeting with the Housing Alliance um, per request from the board from the last meeting. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm looking forward to hopeful approval. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, subject to public comment. Is there anyone in the room that would care to comment? If so, please approach the podium. We have anyone online. No one online. All right. In that case, so I can find my gavel. Public comment is over. Turn this to the board and let's start down this way. Chad. So the uh, shared or common building, um, can you review that one again? You recall from the last meeting, what was uh, contained within that? 
uh, you're talking about the proposed storage sheds on site? Yes, so um, those are still located at the northern, there's one at the northern end and one down in kind of the middle of the site. And those are essentially, I think they're just a four by eight storage shed that's um, also proposed as the trash pickup location. And we worked that out with the trash vendor to have these locations um, be picked up right there with them, so. So it's secured and it's. Correct, it'll have a door. It'll have a door and it'll have, um, yeah, the lock ability to lock and secure it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay. So this is like the fifth amendment of the team and I, the Miami Zimmer is the range and all that stuff is final down but then the inclusion of the eight 525 square foot single family homes. And because we understand they're exempt from the site plan process. So, two things. Can you zoom out and tell me? They're not highlighted on the plan I grabbed, and I'm just trying to figure out do you have another view or drawing that shows that relative to like front runner and half more? Um, so yeah, I apologize. I don't have one that's further zoomed out than this, but um, Front Runner Way is right located right here. This is Scarborough Downs Road. So Tandem Court, which is constructed and occupied is right here. And then Pacer Way, which is constructed just up to my mouse right here. And actually this private alley is partially constructed too. So uh, off the page here, Hackamore is basically above the screen in this location. So so when you do amendments to an existing drawing that you pass all the figures to, to make our life easier, if our life easier to go back, well, that's a good idea to get that. Sorry, especially if I can better understand by and how we collect pictures and colors, you know, the box of frames that I'm going to do some stuff with that wall. But I'm looking at these two sets, and I don't know where these eight family homes go. And I'm not exactly sure why they're exempt from the site plan process. From the uh, uh, Rick, could you look at C101? And that, that gives you, I think, a better view of where they are in the, uh, in the development. So, and we had approved that lot when we approved, um, I believe at the same time we approved the cottages and the open space off of Pacer Way, pretty much at the same time. So, yeah, I kind of got it now. So, on the ver on the very on the first. Second drawing in the set, it shows the empty lot. And then on C101, it shows the buildings in the empty lot. Um, okay. Yeah, and, and if you take a look at that, still on C101, you can see the trailhead that goes down and connects to Grissville Lane. Yeah. So I guess to better understand what you're asking for in this fifth amendment is to the inclusion of these eight family homes. So these weren't included in the first four subdivision plans, correct? Correct. And, and now we're including them on this one. Correct. As an amendment. Correct. Okay. So um, in the verbiage with, that you supplied, it said, we understand this is exempt from the site plan process, but aren't we in the middle of the site plan process here? Or are we just saying that we're past the site plan process and now we're ready to approve this as an amendment? So can you- Single family homes are exempt from the site plan review ordinance. Um, this one's sort of a tricky one. Um, a it, single site, a single single family home, right? Not a, yeah. not a group of, a, every group of, Every group of buildings, every subdivision has to go through the site plan process, correct? 
We don't di differentiate in the site plan exemption if it's on its own lot or not. So it's a loophole, if you will. And so I believe that what they asked to see, in theory, this is a subdivision revision. These homes shouldn't be shown on this. They should really just be asking for the access easements that are going through as the streets. But they had asked, and I'm not sure of the complete history of this, but we had requested additional information to see how the homes were going to be cited on it. It is an, um, a proposal to perhaps look at an amendment in our ordinance so that we clear this up. So if there's a condo regime that maybe has a hundred of these on one lot, it is subject to site plan approval, but it is not the way it is written in our ordinance today. So it's a, it's a bit of a hybrid situation and they've provided information so you can understand it better, but it's really not part of the subdivision. All right, so now, without uh, you know, not just theirs, but if someone buys a single lot and they want to put 10 single family homes on it, they don't have to go through a subdivision planning board? That is correct, the way our ordinance is written today. Oh, I'm going to put some houses up tomorrow. I didn't know. If your zoning That's is That's a crazy loophole. It, it is a bit of a loophole. We if have, zoning, we have subdivisions yeah. in front of us every single night. So what you're saying to the, the town of Scarborough on TV is that if you have a lot and you want to put 10 houses on your lot, you don't have to go through a subdivision. No. You don't have to go through a, you don't have to come to the planning board. You can just start building after you get no, to. No, you still have to do your building permits, but this is the actual language. Um, the construction of or addition to single and two family dwellings and their accessory building structures and areas for parking and vehicular or pedestrian use. Those are exempt from the site plan requirement. So single family and two family. And so, yes. To your point, those typically would be on an individual lot. And so you would see those in the subdivision. You would have a residential development with 5, 10, 50 residential lots. And so we wouldn't see a site plan. This one is because of the unique zoning that is in place that allows them to put multiple homes on one lot. It is not um, specifically required to do a site plan. So let me go back to the applicant. Is this like a trailer park in that these are houses that aren't going to own the land they're just going to be little baby houses on one lot uh dan uh since you've been heavily involved in scarborough ordinances for many many years uh could you please respond sure so we're going through subdivision so we're not avoiding any review um based on the submission requirements we're also going through site plan um, based on what we've provided. So you have before you something that looks like a site plan because staff asked for it. Um, so we don't feel like we're avoiding any review. Um, but in terms of the character of these, and I think you weren't at the last meeting, we actually provided um, illustrations of the building. So for that background, um, these are 500, 525 square foot one bedroom micro homes they're they're not trailers they're um they're pretty cool little uh units that we think will that fit the site well um and we think kind of for um kind of respond to market demand for that type of unit um and the trigger subdivision and we're basically going through um, a site plan light right now um okay so these are single family homes they're just small ones they're going to be on lots that are owned by the people who own the homes it's, it's a condo layout so um the people own or rent the individual building um and there are common ele common elements so it's going to be common open space around them they're going to have assigned parking so it's it's like a more like a condominium kind of layout to give you a, an example, um, though they are small units and the, the, the design is a bit different. Okay. And you're obviously not circumventing the, well, the process doesn't exist, which is a crazy loophole, which if I can take advantage of it, I'm going to. So I, that's a crazy loophole, but I appreciate you guys. Sure. Um, going through the process of actual doing a subdivision plan when apparently you don't have to. Um, Site plan, yeah, we have to go through subdivision. Yeah. All right, so now that 
I've taken up some time and you've explained that. I appreciate the I appreciate the explanation, Autumn. Excellent job. I don't have any questions in regards to this particular or any any issues with this what you're doing in this particular. I just more had questions about the verbiage in the amendment request, I guess I'll say. Yeah, the action, so, the board action. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a problem. I don't I don't have any concerns with what you're doing other than the fact that I think that we have a we have an issue internally um, that we probably need to address and resolve at some point. Thank you. I, I'm fine with this project. Thank you. Roger. Um, I'm basically satisfied with everything too, but I just wanted to get a clarification. Did I hear you mention um, three uh, bollards that were lighted bollards? Yeah, we provided um, uh, three bollards that'll be lit or bollard lighting. Um, and this plan here shows it best. Roger, there's one um, at sort of the, the head of the, the driveway where the sidewalk from uh, the neighboring kind of pocket neighborhood ties in to the project. Uh, one halfway down the access drive and one at the end. Um, those are really to provide some, some overall kind of low level lighting as well as delineate um, for both residents and also folks that are using the trails and kind of passing through the project to, to kind of stay on, stay on route. Aren't those about three or four feet off the ground? You know, the, aren't those- They the are, trails? yeah. Is that gonna be, do you think that's gonna be enough? We were hoping for this being kind of a, you know, fairly um, quiet, not over illuminated kind of neighborhood. So each unit's also gonna have um, lighting um, by the by the door for each oh, okay. for each okay. building. Um, so that was the intent. All right, I'm all set. Thank you, Jen. Um, I don't really have any questions. Um, but <laughs> appreciate the clarification on the subdivision site plan process because, um. While you were presenting, I was actually thinking, wow, this is quite a detailed division plan. Um, and had some comments that I thought maybe I'd save for site plan review and then realized um, we're here. Um, and so I don't really have any comments, but I definitely uh, appreciate your inclusion of the illuminated bollards and um, wayfinding signs. And I just wanna reiterate, um, and also appreciate the comparison here to the other uh, alleyways elsewhere um, on the downs. That was that's helpful to see both um, contextually and just sort of um, how this one differs a little bit, in my opinion. And so, I think the I just I really hope I look forward to seeing. I really want to see this. I'm looking forward to seeing this. I thought the graphics that you presented last time were really um, intriguing, and I'm curious to see how it turns out. And uh, check it out someday, but I think the wayfinding, particularly from the trail to the south to the um, sidewalk and path up to the north is really um, a really important link for this very small piece of the overall program. And I, I see it a little bit different than some of the alleyways that you compared it to um, elsewhere in that most of those, I think, um, are sort of linking together other um, built out hardscape infrastructure, mostly mostly sidewalks. Um, and this one, and not to say that people couldn't walk circuitously on sidewalks, but I think the presence of the trail here to the south and that that if you go on that trail, as I recall, you're, it's very, um, what was I think the term that you used is like organic or so I just sort of picture it like a woods, woodsy kind of trail and then you would pop out into this little neighborhood and um, again, I, you know, I think very highly of the, the overall thought that's gone into the very large picture trail network that you'll be building out as part of each of these little pieces and that that little link, um, I just, I do just think is key. And so um, you can do a lot with little wayfinding signs. I think that's great to hear. Um, 
and just making sure that anyone that maybe doesn't live in this neighborhood but wants to utilize that network, which is really kind of how I see this little piece as part of the, the overall network, um, is clear that it's a space that they're, they could be in and know how to get out of it or onto the next piece of the network. So I think that's great. That's all I have. Thank you. And Rick. Yeah, um, it's going to be quite a, a neat little project, I think. I, I just have a couple of questions. Obviously, it's going to relate to the bollards here. Are the color on those are going to still be 3000K, and there'll be no up lights. We'll have that dome yeah. on top of yeah. that bollard. Um, I'm just a little concerned about the darkness around those sheds. Um, for safety purposes, it might be, you know, you got a swing door there or something like that, and it potentially could be pretty dark, even with porch lights on, um, especially that one in the middle there, that shed. Just wondering if maybe we could add a couple more, uh, one, yeah. by, one by each one of those sheds so that there's some light. I think we could do that, or we could do a a wall light with a that's cut off. Yeah, um, we can look at that for sure. Okay, and do either, Rick. Yeah, I have no preference. Uh, you can work it out with staff, but I think I think what we'd want to have is just the cut sheets of what those fixtures would be uh, for the record. Yeah, uh, to be included in the packet. Um, that's all I have. Oh no, I had one other thing. Um, there's going to be signage on that turnaround area, right? Uh, because that's you can't park there. There's going to be uh, some way in which nobody will be parking by that one shed. It looks like that's going to be there. Oh, yes. We're going to have fire lanes signage, and we're, we're going to work with the fire department on some striping that um, also gets that message okay. across. Yeah, because yep. you just don't want a car there when the fire truck has to yep. get out of there. Yep. Or get in. Okay, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of minor comments, I guess. Um, do you have any sense yet what that street is going to be? The name? Yeah. Um, we're considering simplicity, but we're not final on that. We need to work with the with the police department to finalize that. Okay. Uh, and I appreciate the appearance of the bollards, uh, and also uh, Rick noting that. Um, for safety reasons, uh, additional bollards or a downlight would be very helpful. Um, I also want to express my appreciation. This this lot came to us originally uh, with a discussion that there would be small small homes on here, small houses, uh, and uh, we expressed an interest, I believe, at that time of knowing more about it because it, like the pocket neighborhoods, uh, this became a unique. A, a neat, a unique feature that the Downs was was going to engage in, and I appreciate the uh, all of the additional information that you've given us. I think this um, this project holds uh, holds some real opportunity to be replicated elsewhere with small, relatively affordable housing um, that more and more of our folks can can take a look at and could be the first step in in permanent housing for some people so appreciate what you've done here saying that i have a draft motion which i'm going to read i move to approve the project titled the downstown center residential fifth subdivision amendment proposed by crossroads holdings llc as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 9-2-22 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the fifth amendment plan establishes eight single family homes on lot 35 off of Pacer Way. It also includes a minor easement adjustment for removal of drainage and access easement between lots 44 and 45 and creation of a separate drainage and access easement on lot 40 to convey town drainage to a private storm drain line. Waivers, number one, section 4D2, to reduce the minimum drive aisle width from 25 feet to 20 feet. Conditions, one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall, A, establish striping for a fire lane between units three and four, as approved by the fire department. B, work with the town's E911 addressing officer to provide a name for the private way. 
C, provide a private drive signage and gateway plan. D, increase drive aisle width as discussed at the 9-19-22 planning board meeting. E, address comments in the Haley Ward memo dated 9-13-22. F, pay the traffic impact fees, total $2,392. Hikus Parkway at US Route 1, $990. Dunstan Corners, $1,402. G, pay the recreation contribution fee, $500 per unit. H, provide final approvals by the Portland Water District and Scarborough Sanitary District. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Two, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the Planning Department. All plan modifications are to be completed prior to scheduling and pre-construction to scheduling the pre-construction meeting. Three, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall submit evidence in the form of a letter or plan prepared and stamped by a professional engineer who either prepared the post-construction stormwater management plan and its associated facilities or supervised the plan and facilities construction and implementation. The letter of plan shall certify that the stormwater management facilities have been installed in accordance with the approved post-construction stormwater management plan and that they will function as intended by said plan. Is there a second? Second. Second by Roger Bewley. Rachel. Madam Chair, may I make a point of clarity, please? Um, Certainly. The, the site plan that they showed tonight includes the 20 foot uh, easement through the section there. And so I would like to make sure that we have the correct site plan versus the 9-2 version. The one that they showed tonight is just a bit different. Okay, so the amendment would be whatever the date of the plan is that you guys have shown. What's the date on that one? Uh, I don't have a formal date, but we'll provide it. I mean, it can be today. The 919 plan? Yes, yeah. the 919 plan. Okay, the other thing I want to uh, amend that to the 919 plan. And the other thing, Rachel, I wanted to mention, I think I uh, um, I hadn't given you your most recent uh, copy. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would suggest uh, adding a condition 1i, uh, which we have language for right here. When I revise plan sets as discussed at the 919-22 planning board meeting, including with respect to lighting. Is that, uh, Roger, you seconded it? Is that acceptable? Yep. All right. In that case, we can go for a vote. Um, Madam Chair, I just have one question. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> not that I'm not going to vote in a positive manner on this, but on the last one and on this one, I didn't realize it until you were reading the fees. These are only one bedroom units, but on the last one that we did, the nice lady on the phone had a question about school, and I don't see the school impact fees on any of these, Erica. The school impact fees paid when the permits pulled. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so yeah, th th those are automatic. Yeah, but should they be mentioned on the in the future? We we can talk about that later. Um, but I think if we're going to mention recreation fees and things like that, that maybe we should include the school impact fees so that the folks online and and in the room know that everybody's you know paying their fair share for for support of our schools. And I don't believe there's any waiver for school impact fees. No, and to be clear, we included the recreation fees because of the letter that you all received, because normally you wouldn't see that as well on a subdivision of this nature. You'd see that with building permits. So that was just uh, for clarity when we discussed the letter later on in correspondence. Okay, so if, that, if that's the process and we don't include them on here, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that, that I was understood from Eric that even apartments pay school impact fees, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think we can take a vote now. All right. Roger Bailey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Meinke? Yes. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. And Richard Dupree? Yes. All right, thank you very much. That has passed. Thank you. Next item, item number eight, Crossroads Holdings, LLC. 
request a subdivision amendment review of the sixth amendment subdivision of the town center residential district. The amendment would reduce the area of lot 42 and add small access and utility easements. The property is further identified as assessor's map R52, lot four. Eric. Thank you. So this one's pretty straightforward. Um, it will reduce the uh, size of lot 42 in the town center residential district. Um, actually not too far from lot 30, excuse me, lot 35 of uh, the last agenda item. Um, staff has been working with the Downs team and um, I apologize, I've heard this from Angela and she um, couldn't be here tonight, but I'll do my best to describe it um, to get some drainage easements uh, so that and utility ac access easements. So um, drainage can be correctly conveyed from this site. Um, and I think that is about the extent of the changes. And with that, I turn it back to the planning board. Thank you. And for the developer. Uh, thank you, Dan Bacon with Crossroads. Um, as Eric introduced, this is a, a really straightforward amendment um, and it directly relates to your, to your next item, which is a site plan for a housing project. And um, we're essentially just kind of right sizing the lot um, from the old subdivision plan for uh, the program for lot 42. And as Eric indicated, um, establishing both access, drainage and utility easements on this lot to, to benefit this lot and also benefit additional development that would happen uh, next door that will be tied into the site plan in the future. Um, and lastly, there's just kind of a, a minor detail. There's some grading easements on the perimeter of the lot um, to enable um, the, the proper grading of the lot and grading slightly off of the lot um, as the project's phased. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. This is an item that is open for public comment. Is there anyone in the room that would care to comment? Is there anyone online? No one online. In that case, public comment is closed and just throw this open to the board if anyone cares to comment or question. I looked it over and I have no comments or questions. All right, thank you. I'm seeing a bunch of heads waving. Nope. Uh, I have no comment. So I have a draft motion. The Sixth Amendment amended Town Center Residential District Subdivision Subdivision Review. I move to approve the project titled Sixth Amended Town Center Residential Subdivision proposed by Crossroads Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 8322 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the proposal amends the existing town center residential subdivision at the Downs by reducing the lot size of 42, of lot 42, and adding access and utility easements. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jen Ladd. Uh, call the roll, please. Rick Dupree? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Roger Bailey? Yes. Rick Meinke? Yes. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Thank you. That passes. Just as a reminder, we do try and take a break around 830. We're moving pretty speedily so far. Uh, and we do not undertake any brand new um, applications after 10 o'clock. Item number nine, Crosswoods Holdings LLC request a site plan review for Hackamore Place Apartments 2. The project would create three 15 unit apartment buildings in the town center residential district of the Downs. The property is further identified as assessors map R52, lot four. Eric. Thank you. As Rachel mentioned, uh, this project Hackamore 2 Apartments would create three apartment buildings, 15 units each. Um, the planning board was not able to get to this item at its last meeting on August 29th. Um, so the applicant has submitted its uh, staff, uh, its response to staff comments for the board's review. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to the board. Thank you. 
and for the applicant. Well, thank you. Um, this plan I have up here identifies the site we're referring to. Um, so you just approved the subdivision amendment uh, for lot 42. Um, we've added the, the development activity around this site. So lot 42 is highlighted here. Um, it's on the north side of Hackamore Avenue, um, just to the south of the site across Hackamore Ave are the apartments that are currently under construction. Um, there's 36 units under construction to the south. Um, notably to the, to the west, which is the left on this plan, is the American House uh, at the Downs, the senior care facility. Um, actually in the process of starting site work, which is exciting. Um, on the next week or so, uh, that's just to just to the west, and then the remainder of town set, set excuse me, town center residential is is uh, surrounding this site. In terms of kind of more detailed layout, um, so there's three buildings proposed. Um, they have they're proposed to have 15 units uh, per building. Um, they're configured to in a way kind of mirror the layout of the apartments across the street, but also have a, a, a nice strong connection to both Front Runner, um, Front Runner Way, which is on, on the left here, um, as well as Hackamore Avenue that's um, below the units on the plan. There's two access points. One will be off of Front Runner um, to provide access really across from uh, the senior care facility and then there's another access point proposed directly across from the apartments across the street on Hackamore Avenue. Um, this is the vicinity where there would be access easements. Um, these have been designed so that they can provide access to this project, but also in the future as more planning occurs, um, these can provide internal driveway connections to, to development just kind of to the north. Um, up in this vicinity. So you'll see this driveway in particular coming off of Front Runner Avenue, um, coming in, and then you would turn right, you know, to, to, to access parking for these units, um, turn left to, to access you know, future development there. In terms of other kind of details, there's a combination of mostly um, open air uh, off street parking but also um, some garages that are designed with the tandem parking has been quite successful for the project on the eastern edge of, of the site plan. Um, I'll jump to the utilities and if you have more details on those, Drew will jump up and explain them. Um, but the primary utilities to, to serve the project will come off of Front Runner um, and Front Runner has not been constructed yet. So that's good from a kind of connection standpoint. So we're not getting back into Hackamore Avenue uh, for, for utilities, which is um, at least binder paved at this point. So um, water, sewer, um, most of the utilities are coming off of, of Front Runner um, to provide services and to, to each of the buildings. And we've designed um, them in a way to also be able to serve future development to the north, um, particularly for sewer. And Drew can jump into those details if you want to hear about those. In terms of the landscape plan, um, this is the, the landscape plan. Uh, we've designed this in, in a way somewhat similar to the apartments across the street where there's a larger front lawn area um, between Hackamore Avenue and in the buildings. We also have a terrace area for um, outdoor sitting and activity for, for residents. That's located right here at kind of the crossroads of the, the sidewalk system. Um, there's robust plantings around the base of the building as well as uh, street trees um, around the lawn area and also along the perimeter of, of the buildings by the parking lot. You'll see on this layout and also when we get into kind of the building architecture that uh, the first floor programming is a good bit different than um, other other uh, apartments that have been done at the downs where there's actually seven um, units on the first floor 
And so four of those units are accessed directly from the exterior. So there's sidewalks to each of those uh, entry points into the first floor, really for kind of the end units in the building. And then there's three units that are accessed in the first floor from the common hallway. And then of course the upstairs units are accessed from a common hallway and stairway. Um, so we've designed that in a way to um, provide sort of more individual entrances and then outdoor patios for those four units on, on each end of the buildings. Um, from the first meeting, our submission to the, to the follow-up, which we were able to do, as Eric indicated, we've made some updates to the landscape plan, particularly around um, buffering the back of the garage um, towards future development to the east. We've provided um, to provide good screening of the back of the garage. We're providing a combination of a six foot tall fence um, that alternates with a landscape buffer so that the rear wall of the garage won't be seen at all um, and provides a, a good buffer to whatever happens on the area to the east um, because that back of the garage is actually only eight feet tall, you know, overall before you hit the, um, the, um, the eave. So uh, that will be entirely screened um, from the site to, to the east. In terms of the building architecture, um, I've sp spoke a bit about the, the floor plans and the unit layout, um, but this is an image of, of this 15 unit building. Um, as we kind of get closer to the town center and also to vary architecture and, and to have a more kind of modern uh, modern look. We've gone with a flat roof building um, and that incorporates really kind of bay window elements. Um, the, if you can see here in, in two locations on both sides, the front and the rear facade have these bays um, that provide additional living space for the upstairs units and a nice architectural feature. There are also the entryways for the first floor units that are direct access. Um, and we're pretty excited about this, this building architecture um, being different, being a bit more modern. Um, and some of the other um, key components to the architecture are um, we have second floor balconies, um, but we've configured them in a way that they're kind of, um, they're in towards the center of the building, really to accentuate kind of the end caps and the second and third floor, um, these corner elements. Um, provide different kind of living space layout than some of the other apartments within the project. And um, we're kind of varying the, the siding width and, and material uh, between the first floor and the, the upper stories. Um, so that's a sense for kind of the, the aesthetics uh, of the building on the, the exterior. This shows you um, just the, the, the typical elevations. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop there. And I'm pleased to answer questions uh, that the board may have. Thank you. This uh, item is uh, subject to a public hearing. Is there anyone in the room that would like to comment? Eric, anyone online? No. Thank you. Hearing is over, I turn this over to the board. Who would like to start? Jen? Um, just have a question. Um, the graphic on site distance that we provided, there's a comment about a particular tree potentially limiting that. Oh. Drew will speak to the site distance graphic. I don't think I have it. So. That's landscaping. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer. Um, so we worked it out with the peer traffic reviewer um, because of the proximity next to the intersection, not providing the full 200 foot site distance, but a little bit shorter given what the vehicle speeds will actually be. Um, so there was a, it's, and it's always tough because of how fast the downs is moving. It was a planned, I'll call it tree in this location, which has showed up as existing on our plans for chronologically reasons. Um, so what we did is we moved the existing tree south. So what we'll do is we'll update the previous sets to make sure that tree doesn't get put in that location so that 
it's not within the site triangle looking left. So that was the comment and that's what we addressed in the last submission. Okay. So the, um, got it. So the existing tree that doesn't maybe exist yet, um, will you actually have in excess of 115 feet? By, by making that change? No, the tree was within the 115 foot side distance. So gotcha. that will get us to, if you were to look left, you'd have the full 115 foot. Um, previously, we've been kind of negotiating some trees being in that, just not a line of trees. And sure. that was the request to move that one out. So sure. that's what we did. Okay. It was probably more uh, the time, the like sequence of those things. I wasn't quite clear. Correct. But, um, that's fine. And I think uh, I agree with the other comments that the proximity there to a uh, stop control. They don't. I think that's fine. Um, but thanks for explaining, Tree. That's all I have. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Roger. Uh, are these um, are these units basically the same as a Hackmore One apartments? The um, first floor uh, units and floor plan are um, entirely different. Okay. So the first floor has all. Uh, one bedroom units and the units I think are smaller uh, than the one bedroom units in Hackamore one that's across the street. The second and third floor units are two bedroom units and they're, they're very similar to Hackamore. They're a little bit bigger because the building's a little bit bigger overall in order to provide the first floor layout that um, we're proposing. Um, Hackamore one, is that the, um, are those the units that were gonna be sort of white with red trim or something? Yeah. Okay. Your, your red trim, if I recall, right? The Hackamore is red siding and white trim. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, the thing that uh, popped out to me, though, when I looked at this initially, was the garage, the garage and the, um, the blank walls. Mm -hmm. I was kind of curious why, because on Hackamore 1, you did put, I, I believe there's windows in, the, in that garage, aren't there? Along Hackmore One, we did, um, and there's been some concern about those windows in terms of lack of privacy in backyards. So we did that, um, and we provided a landscape landscaping in addition to that. So, not knowing the layout um, of development to the east, uh, we felt it was a better approach to provide privacy through screen walls, um, nicely uh, designed kind of fencing and landscaping together, um, which really doesn't enable you to see the, the garage at all um, at that level. And, and that, that screening and everything is gonna be on that lot? It's but on this lot and we actually are able to better incorporate it on this lot than we did with Hackamore. Cause that with the Hackamore site, we had less space um, to provide it all within the, the apartment site. We were like right on the property boundary, which became kind of a design challenge. Okay, I guess, I, guess, um, I think that's all I have other than, is it fair to assume that pace away is just gonna continue north? Um, there'll be development in that area, whether it's, you know, a through road connection or, or not really depends on um, final layout wetlands. There's some wetlands in that area that we need to, to be cognizant of in terms of our layout. So okay. I think I'm all set. All right. Thank you. Who's next? Rick Manking. Yes. Um, in staff comments, they mentioned about a double headlight on the north mm. end. Is there a reason for the, that being a double when we don't know what's going on beyond that? Yeah, we laid it out so that it creates the opportunity for parking, another parking bay there, um, and showed it as a double. We likely would do is is try to install a single, but have that pole be, you know, you'd be able to add a head. And I'm not a lighting expert to know how easy that is, Rick. Um, mm -hmm. But that was the intent. So, that so you're only going to install one head, though. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, but true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And just just to clarify, the the double head was more just a visual aspect. 
to make sure that the pull is ordered with the additional knockout that we want for the no, second head okay. to add in. Uh, there's only one head on it as proposed in the photometric plan that okay. we're doing right now. It's just try to save save that down the line. So we can add a note to clarify that to make sure it gets ordered that way and not too. Yeah, just make sure. Well, on. it's up to you, but as long as the only one goes up yeah. at this point. And then on page four of your, your narrative here, it struck me, and I'd like to just chat about it because I don't see any charging station allocations in this plan. But you say in your narrative, charging stations will be provided to service a number of electric vehicles in the parking lot. Parking stalls identified to accommodate charging stations are shown on the site plan. I didn't see them, but it may be because I can't see anymore. They say umpires can't see to begin with, and I probably am worse than that. But what struck me here is it says, as designs move further into the down development and into the proposed town center, opportunities for EV parking are expected to become more common. I think that's kicking the can down the street because most of the charging on EVs are done when the car is at home or at their place of residence. So moving the chargers into the proposed town center seems counter intuitive to that statement. And I'd just like to see how you would address that. Yeah, so there, in terms of what's proposed on this site, um, we have this on the utility plan and maybe it wasn't bold utility. enough. Um, we have a, this area is dedicated for EV charging and they're on the plan. There's three different chargers shown. Um, and I think it's six spaces and then okay. I did not look on the utility plan. Yep. Yeah, um, and then we're providing for, you know, opportunities in the, in the garage area as well. Um, so you're putting power into the garage. Yeah. I think the intention with this site plan is to actually have a separate transformer for that area of the project. Um, we've run into trouble trying to manage some of these off of like one building's house meter and we're, mm -hmm. we're working through that. So that's the intention is to um, do that installation. And we've also been kind of doing conduit for future opportunities. We actually are meeting tomorrow um, with Revision Energy to talk more about some of the different charging opportunities in terms of um how the how you can group them and they can actually yeah. charge a car faster and then when it gets near it it adds kind of the best power practices to yeah charger of that same on that same pedestal yeah among yeah. other things so we're yeah. just kind of meeting with them specific to this um because as you know we're not experts and it's a very emerging kind of thing in terms of how that to incorporate so but that's our that's our um, intention here. I think the note about the future is it's also time, you know, more as time goes mm -hmm. by. I'm just more or less missing are opportunities yep. in, in our residential areas specifically. And then, you know, I'm, I've mentioned it more oh, than yeah. once. Uh, so regardless of that, uh, I'm glad to hear you're, you're working. Uh, are the ones that you've been in, are they networked or are they just off the meter? The ones that we've done so far on the project have been off the meter and tied into, you know, one apartment building there. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Well, whoever, whoever wants to go first, I'm Russell, if you need to. Uh, certainly appreciate the effort with the uh, multiple bike pads and the covered bike uh, pavilion and also the uh, potential gathering area for the uh, terrace. Um, are there other amenities that are being offered here that I guess have been learned from previous developments? There's, no, I mean, the focus is kind of that front lawn area, that front terrace area um, and the, the covered bike shelters. I think those are kind of the primary exterior amenities. Um, yeah. And then the HVAC is all roof mounted? Yes. Yeah. That's all that I have. Great. Thank you. Rick DePerry. 
I just have a couple questions. I, I like the layout and all that. Um, so the garage, how does the parking work, I guess? Um, Cause you got seven, one bedrooms, eight, two bedrooms in each unit. So that's 21 and 24. So that's 45 total bedrooms, right? So how, how did you calculate the parking? Did you do it off our our um, code requirement kind of book or did you just figure this is the boat, the right parking? We did um, and also, you know, off of um, past lessons learned and kind of what, my main properties recommends the property management company in terms of parking. Um, the garages, you know, are for you pay an extra fee to have a garage space and you also have the space in front of the garage. Third tandem okay. um, parked. So you would um, the same unit renter would would have both of those spaces. Okay. And they're not assigned spaces out front. They're just wherever you park wherever. They are assigned within off street. And then there's on street parking that is. Okay guest parking, kind of overflow, et cetera. And those are unassigned because that's okay. there within the public or what will be at the public street right away. So the parking in the parking spaces are assigned to particular units. Yes. Okay. All right. And I guess I was just kind of leading to where Rick was a minute ago in that you have the six spaces for charging and then, you know, you may have some charging in the garage as well. Um, I'm not, you know, we don't have any zoning ordinance that requires charging. And, and I don't think, I think right now it's, it would be a little bit hard to come up with one based on, there's a lot of variables, but you might want to think about, like you said, if you were putting conduit in the ground for provisions for charging later, that's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we can't tell you to do that. It's really, it would be better than digging up your plants later on, I would think, but that's really up to you. Um, because I'm not sure. I think the six that you have today are fine, but five years from now, you might find that a third of these, these are these are apartments, right? They're not for sale, there's not condos. Or they they're are, apartments. They're, yeah. they're they're rental, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're rental units, but they're in a very nice area and I'm sure they're gonna be very nice apartments. So you're probably gonna have younger folks there that are, not that us old folks don't drive EVs, but um, you might have younger people there and you might find that a third of them or half of them have EVs. And this is Maine, so nobody wants to park a mile from their house to charge their car and then and then walk back to their apartment. So just the yep. thought, if you put yep. conduit in the ground now while you're putting the other, while you're putting in the conduit for the utilities, it probably makes sense. Um, I didn't see, any, I'm not gonna say what I didn't see because I probably looked right at it, but I guess I didn't see any elevations in this particular package, but I think you supplied those yeah. the last time. I know I've seen them and everything that you've done out there looks great. So I guess I don't need to see them. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a few things. Um, first of all, a, a comment about the architecture. Uh, you're right that it is moving much more to, to the modern. Uh, <clears throat> our design standards call for a New England vernacular. Um, I think, I, I suspect more and more the New England vernacular is moving towards a, a more modern interpretation of some of the old styles. Uh, and I think um, this building, these buildings are are in the line of a new, a, a newer New England vernacular. Uh, I was really intrigued by the way you have um, the outside, some of the apartments available through the outside, um, as though they are much more somebody's home than an apartment mm -hmm. uh, with that separate entrance. I do have a bit of a problem with the, um, the palette that you've chosen while you have a lot of variation in the facade, that darker palette tends to blend the variation so that it's less obvious. Um, and the effect of that color uh, is a very heavy building, 
a very heavy and bulky building. Do you have a variation in the color? It's tough to see from these. Yeah, the the bay is intended to, to be um, a different shade. So these elements here, these bay windows, mm -hmm. don't show up great in what you see here. Um, the intention is it to be kind of along the same kind of color palette as you, as you can tell, but um, have some distinction in terms of shade so that they stand out a little bit more um, and are obviously kind of visually you're drawn to it as an entrance and also um, as an architectural feature. And uh, the other intention is to, and I'm not an architect, so I'm playing one right now, but in terms of uh, the, the siding material, um, is to really kind of accentuate the first floor, having a wider board, um, having this band really uh, separate the first floor from the upper stories. Um, and that is there a difference in color between the first floor and the upper stories, or is it just the uh, material that's used? Right now, it's not a different color. It's the same color. It's, it's more relying on shadow lines and then more different shade on those bays. Um, the windows are going to be a different color than, <clears throat> they'll be a different color than the, um, the trim and the siding material too. I, I, I guess I would urge you to take a look at possibly a little more variation in the, in the tone, in the color, uh, a little lighter in some areas. It, it from, from these designs, from what we can see, it still looks heavy and I can't, I, I can see how it could mass rather than uh, provide an interest. So, so that looking at the bays, I don't see that they're different other than in terms of the color. Mm -hmm. So I'd ask you to, to take a, really to take a look at that, to lighten the effect of the, of the massing of the building. These are larger buildings than we've had because they, they, they have more apartments to them, do they not? They're a couple of feet longer. Um, they're not, they're not, I don't think you could, you would tell dimensionally that they're bigger. I think they're a few feet longer, uh, a few feet wider. Um, a dark color tends to emphasize bulk. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I, I guess, my, yeah, uh, my comment on that and, and my request that you, that you just take a look at it and see if there's a possibility of more variation there. Um, <clears throat> the fencing and the landscaping in back of the garage, is that, uh, does that appear in any of our, in, in any of the material you sent? I don't recall seeing it. It's on the landscape plan. Um, but, not, but it doesn't tell, it, it really isn't effective for me to see how, when, when you say it really, um, it really buffers the garage up to the last two feet without really seeing how that works, that's not helpful to me uh, to help to make a decision as to whether that works or whether we need to see the windows. So I would appreciate being able to get a, an artist's view of the fence, which is com made composed of what? It would be a wood fence. Um, and it, the intention is that it's 16 feet long and it's six feet tall. And then between the fence sections, there would be um, a comparable uh, distance of landscaping so that there's a pattern that's created. Um, and the, bit, the wall itself is only eight feet, six inches tall. So you wouldn't see the, you wouldn't see the rear of the building. Okay, well, when you say it's a wood fence, is that a stockade fence? Is that a, what, is, what kind of fence? I thought it was in our package, but if it, if, you, if you could, yeah. I appreciate it if you could point that out to me, if it is in the package. I just put it up on the screen and shows the construction style of it. So that's solid? It's or um, slatted. It's slatted with space in between. Slatted, yeah, yeah. And the plantings in between. How does it look against the against the garage? 
plantings I don't have in they're shown here. So on the landscaping plan. So what you just looked at are the fence sections, um, which are shown here. And then there's evergreens in between each uh, fence section. And then you'd have another fence section. And there's one, two, three, four, five sections of fence, and then four uh, segments of, of plantings in between. I think it looks like the plantings are only, you know, a six foot gap um, with plantings that would, with three, tree, three shrubs that would fill the space. Is it all mulched in back or is it turf? Behind the garage will be, between the fence and the garage would be uh, crushed stone um, for a drip edge. And then on the other side of that would be basically the property line, you know, it'd be grassed into whatever occurs to the, to the east of the site. So the fence is right on the property line? No, it's three, <clears throat> three to four feet. What's in between the fence and the property line? Um, for now, it would be grading because we don't we don't have a plan yet for uh, what is to the left. So it would be a slope until that area is is designed and kind of basically matches in to to the the grading on this site. We don't have programming for for that area yet. So water drips down, water runs down. Is that runoff there? If if you've got the runoff, you've got the drip line. There's a drip line, and there's an under drain that takes the the, the storm water, and I believe it ties. And then the, if on the other side of the fence, if you have nothing planned except some grading, what's to prevent that from eroding? So we actually have a gutter along the back side of that building to collect the runoff into a small roof drain system, if you will, and to get it to the <laughs> location that we need to get it to, which is at the southern drive so what dan was mentioning is gonna be a crushed stone strip just from a construction strip off the back of a building up into the fence and the tree buffer beyond that so in between the tree buffer and the property line we're going to stabilize that with vegetation so it's going to be grass okay that's and, that and that's what i needed yeah, to know and then we'll match the grade with the future development as well um and beyond that you know we don't know what's going to happen from the next development but it'll be grass and vegetated until then okay um, you've asked essentially for a waiver for um, to have one of the street uh, one of the street parking areas uh, parking is part of your uh, parking for the whole uh, apartment complex. Correct? You want one of the one of the street lots not lots but one of the street slots to be Use one of uh on street parking towards our our calculation yeah um i know we've had problems in a sense with that in the past because once that area becomes part of the town becomes a town street um our our folks need the cars off the street in any snow emergency where would a car go if it was parked there? So our property managers have a system for when snow is removed out of the individual apartment sites to locate elsewhere. Um, so it would be handled in a similar way um, to, to that. Which is? It varies by site. Um, so there's, and I don't know all of the mechanics of, of where the different cars go, but they, they, that's how they handle snow removal um, right now on site is if the streets plowed, then there's some cars that go on the street. If there's other locations that are more commercial in nature, um, cars are located there for, for plowing purposes. So that would be handled in the same way. Well, <clears throat> that, that doesn't exactly respond to what I asked. And that is you have a car parked there and, and it's parked there because uh, all of the rest of the lots in the uh, slots in the building are taken care of. There are already cars there and there's snow and that resident has to move his car because it has to be off the street. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that there's somebody who's going to come along and tell them where to move. Yeah. The, the, 
property manager does that today with apartments within our project um mill village the, the first phase uh the white buildings on your way up the downs road have the same situation where there's certain number of spaces that are provided on street uh the planning board approved approved of that at the time um and there's a system for notifying residents on when snow removal is occurring and, and having the cars relocated so that's how it's handled today i i don't run that department so i can't give you all the details about how that occurs and here's here's my concern as we get closer and closer to the town center um more and more these on-street parking areas are going to be used by visitors to the various events in the town center mm -hmm. uh and that means it's going to get tougher and tougher for residents or visitors to find spaces is there any other place on within the lot that that extra slot can go, that extra parking space can go. I guess we can look at it, um, certainly. Um, I think one of the challenges we have, not challenges, but opportunities we have is to not continue to just rely on off-street parking. We have a lot of on-street parking that we have in front of these sites um, that I think actually will be underutilized because we're we maybe relying too heavily on off street parking. So it, um, we want to be using on and off street parking, especially as we get into the town center and not just have off street parking because it leads to maybe building more parking than you need. Um, well, this is this is one slot. Um, so I appreciate it if you see if you can find that slot on there since it's a specific waiver that you've asked for. Um, let me uh, also indicate that I'm kind of with uh, Rick here in terms of of, of EV spaces. I, I do think uh, we need to look to the future. Um, I appreciate your putting the conduits in all of the, the garages. Um, if you don't have six EV cars in there, you are then going to be having people who don't have EVs parking in the EV area because that's the way it's been set up. In other words, instead of seeing an EV charging station as an as an extra place for anybody to, to pull up and know that only EV cars are gonna be there charging, um, you're counting upon those also to be part of the regular parking. Mm -hmm. uh, so in effect, that's putting a crunch on people's ability to use those charging stations if we end up with, or if you end up with um, the number of cars that the calculations indicate that you might end up with. So I, I think um, do you have any questions of us on what you need to bring for the next time? So it sounds like looking at colors of the building um, and any updates we can make to that um, and looking at adding additional parking space and fine tuning our approach to EV charging. Those are the eliminating the um, double headed lighting. Um, is that what the board's interested in? Anything I'm missing there? I, well, and that's what I'm going to ask. Is that, uh, is there anything else the board would like to see when it comes back, when this comes back? Have we, Eric, have we pretty much Yeah, I think covered so. what you need? Okay. I guess from um, just to kind of put some things on the site plan that we've talked about tonight, um, I think showing the, the fence on the actual site plan itself instead of just on the landscaping plan would help. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then Rachel, I'm not sure if um, seeing renderings of the, the fence. Would yeah, I, I would like to see the renderings of the fence and landscaping from a street, a street side view. I mean, basically from ground level. If it's if it works, if it appears that though is going to provide appropriate screening, then to my way of thinking, uh, then I would be comfortable with that. If it doesn't look as though it's going to do it, then we're going to have to go back and take a look at what the ordinance actually calls for, which would be the windows. Yeah, we can do that. I mean, there's also landscaping along the street 
the street too that'll help with that so we can show that to you yeah okay uh roger yeah just um question for dan uh don't you have another um complex either condos or apartments that have a dark color similar to this to the shade yeah the color the siding material and the windows are the same at tandem court um the first condo is coming into town center residential um that's the same siding material that we're proposing okay yeah that's a good example okay so. yep it's a different it's a slightly different architecture um and slightly smaller buildings yeah, yeah. but it's a, it's a shade very similar it's, yeah yeah and, and the other i was i was just thinking about this when uh, you're discussing the uh off, the uh, on street parking um I mean, there's a lot of density with units already developed over there. I, are you guys given any consideration to uh, whenever you have a small extra space of land of just making like a community parking lot to accommodate any overflow? Are you finding any, are you running in, into any trouble so far with too many vehicles, you know, people coming to visit and things like that? Um, we're not struggling with that other than yeah. Gris, Gris. No, I'm just thinking of all the phases. So Grist Mill was the, the single family neighborhood. Grist Mill um, had somewhat of, of a problem with that kind of early on because they're, they don't have any on-street parking at all. Um, and so that's the area of the project that we kind of lessons learned, for example. And then with the town center residential phase, the, those single family, because they have on-street parking in front, um, that that serves well as kind of guest parking. Um, and But in terms of programs like this, um, we're not running into issues with, with parking, like the Gables is a good example on the Downs Road Tandem Court. Um, both of those have off street parking and then they also have the on street parking and um, there's plenty of on street spaces open so far. And that's our, our thinking is that having a, some, uh, a modest amount of parking for the project on street um, is appropriate in this context. And then also having plenty of additional spaces for guests. That's, that, that was our thinking with this particular site. Um, Sorry, not to cut you off here, Dan, but I do want to mention too, regarding the on street versus on site parking spaces is, you know, one of the overall goals of the downs and the development is to, to, to reduce impervious area. And specifically what that does is, is it reduces salt, it reduces sand that's produced and put onto the ground that eventually goes into the streams that we're working to protect. So if we utilize on street parking more, it significantly, significantly reduces the amount of impervious area because you don't have to create additional drive aisles, right? So you reduce that 12, 24 feet, if you will, of a drive aisle that you need to sand and salt if you're able to utilize a road that's already there. So that's kind of one of the goals that we've been working on is just overall less impervious from thermal impacts into the natural resources, but as well as just from salt and sand and all that. So uh, that's just one of the goals we've been looking at. We saw this as an opportunity for on-street parking and trying to balance that understanding the, you know, the goal of trying to make sure everyone parks on site, but as well as, you know, reducing impervious area. I do. I, I agree that that's um, a little difficult to balance. And that's why I brought it up because I think it's going to get harder and harder to balance the more we get into the, the center of the downs uh, and to start to think about that. Now um, I think I've tend to think about on street parking as in a sense, additional in other words, that the residents are taken care of um, by the appropriate number of parking spaces uh, assigned to them or within the uh, within the development. And then what is on street are the visitors, the guests, the door dash person who's going to you know run up with some with some food, um, fast delivery sort of things, places for people to park. If those areas are taken over by the residents uh, because they don't have enough parking within the development, uh, then the visitors are going to go elsewhere and the delivery folks are going to go elsewhere. We're going to see a different sort of traffic. So I think that's that's the balance we have to take a look at. Uh, and I think one spot 
one additional spot inside that development is not going to significantly impact the amount of salt used. Thank you. And we'll see you again. All right, let's, uh, this is convenient time. Let's take a five minute break. You can use that clock to decide what five minutes is. Thank you.
Uh, excuse me, item 10, Evergreen Credit Union is requesting a site plan review for a 3,156 square foot credit union located at 617 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U31, Lot 43. Eric. Thank you. So Evergreen is back in front of the planning board after a site plan review in August. Um, there were a couple minor site plan um, things that the applicant has worked to address as well as some some drainage, um, some cleaning and work in Route 1. Um, the largest issue that we've been working through is the right in right out access onto Route 1. Um, since the board's last review, the applicant has obtained permission from the abutting mobile gas station to the north uh, to uh, include emergency access via their, um, their entrance to Route 1 and then um, into the northern part of the site. Uh, that would allow uh, the applicant to be able to revise the right in right out um, to include a raised um, concrete apron. Um, since these changes have occurred in the last week or so, the board hasn't actually been able to see um, any of those updates, but uh, hopefully we can talk about that and look at that tonight with the applicant. Uh, staff has provided the board with a draft motion for consideration, which includes conditions uh, that the applicant finalized the right in right out design and the emergency access with the planning department and peer traffic engineer review team. And with that, I would turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And for the applicant. Thank you, Eric. My name is Craig Burgess with Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of Evergreen Credit Union. So when we first met with the board in August, this was the design that was presented to the board at that time. Um, shortly after that meeting, we went and we met with the fire department and what the fire department was looking for was a 20 foot clear width for access into the site. We then resubmitted the plan set, which included a revised design, which is what's shown up here. And we added this concrete apron, which is a concrete apron that was sitting about two inches higher than the grade in the paved area. But what the planning staff thought this would allow for left-hand turns into the site. So we all scratch our heads a little bit more. And Evergreen continued to both work with mobile and the diner people. And just last week, we were able to, to get in touch with mobile. And we're still in the process of coordinating this emergency access into the, into the site from the mobile gas station. So what would be proposed at this location would be a 20 foot access aisle directly from approximately this area. That is something that still needs to be negotiated with mobile a little bit. So we've shared this, this drawing with them today. We would have a 24 foot wide swing gate here with a Knox box for fire access. So this would be for emergency access only. This entry here would go back to a design that would be very similar to what you originally looked at, but we would remove this concrete apron here and put vertical granite curb at the location on both sides of that right in, right out access. So that's where we're at. Evergreen Credit Union is still working with mobile to finalize this plan. Once this location is finalized, we'll go ahead and, and redesign the site as needed to, to show this and there's some minor storm drainage that's also affected with this location here. The other site, the other um, site comments were relatively minor. There are still some remaining stormwater changes that may be needed. Uh, one, of, one of the comments was to verify that there was an actual outlet pipe to that catch basin within Route 1 the town has since gone and cleaned that catch basin. So now that the outlet pipe is fully exposed and it appeared to be in good condition, but I believe in working with town staff, we will further explore that. Um, so we'll further explore this storm drainage network here to show that it has the capacity to take that storm water from this site. So Sebago Technics will plan on working with the town engineer and planning staff on that as well as revising this right in, right out to better meet the town comments and also understand that there needs to be fire access into the site. So I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you. 
This is an item that is available for public comment. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment? Anyone online, Eric? Seeing no one online, Madam Chair. All right, seeing no one online, public comment period is over. It goes to the board. Um, this one, uh, does anybody have a comment? Uh, Jen? Um, thank you for showing this revised graphic because I really thought it was, my eyesight was bad because I couldn't find the connection to the abutting property. Um, so I, I uh, certainly that's terrific from a, an emergency access standpoint. And I think the uh, obviously we have to accommodate that, but the, the trade off to the what the way that you will be able to narrow the entrance here on Route 1, I think is um, good. So I'm, I'm, I think that's great to hear. Uh, um, the first question that comes to my mind when um, I see this graphic is, is um, you know, what potential exists for that to be a more formalized access point instead of um, just for emergency access. And it's, it's um, you know, we have a lot of access management issues actually everywhere on Route 1. Um, and in particular, around the Dun Dunstan uh, corner intersection um, itself. And so, um, I, I'm just, I don't, you know, maybe not, we don't need all the details in terms of, um, conversations or like, uh, agreements that were had with the butters, but I'm just curious about the functionality of that, that access point there. And, uh, and also, um, something similar to the South, you're not showing that here, but I'm wondering if there is, um, the potential for that in the future. And if not with the current owner, you know, we, I always think of like our work here, you're, you're coming to us with Evergreen Credit Union and your butters are mobile and um, the, whoever's owning the diner right now. But, you know, we have to think about these lots as being owned by anybody down the road. Um, and so I just, you know, we've uh, I, also on the transportation committee in town, and I know we've talked a lot about access management challenges in other parts of town. and one thing that we always say is like, oh, we wish that this just had a connection to the property next door. And, and I, I'm bringing this up fully recognizing that that is an agreement between two private um, entities and not um, not the responsibility of the town or, or probably even the purview of this board, but just in terms of overall functionality and safety and access of how people are gonna get in and out of the site, that's, that's, those are questions that jumped out at me immediately. Um, that's my first thought. So the intent would be that this this swing gate would remain closed at all times except for emergency purposes, which the fire department would have access to that Knox box. So we understand that this interse intersection here at the mobile gas, this is not ideal. So if there were any changes that would be proposed for more of a formal access, we would of course have to come back in front of the board for that. So at this time, we're really looking at this for emergency purposes only. The, re the revised site plans did show in the southwest corner kind of a potential connection to that private drive. It ha wasn't designed. It might, there would be other changes that would be needed as part of that. And again, we would have to come back in front of the planning board for any changes relative to connection to the diner drive. Sure. Great. Um... Another question is how, I'm still confused on how people coming from the south will access this property. It's, it's not ideal by any means and, and the customers going to Evergreen are just gonna have to get used to the, the traffic to get to the site. Sure, so understood. Do we, I don't know this offhand, do we allow or disallow U-turns at the Dunson intersection? I believe they're not allowed, uh, but I'd have to look into that more. <laughs> I, would hope, I would hope so, but anyway, my, my, my sense is that that will, that is what people will probably do. Right, and so, so I'm, my question is, are we, 
um, teeing that up here by doing that, because if someone were to not, like just logistically, how are they gonna get there? If you're coming from the South, you're either going to take an illegal U-turn at the intersection, or maybe you're looping through someone else's par parking lot, or you're looping around on broad turn and cutting through mobile and coming back out. I, I'm just, um, it's, you know, yeah, I, it's just something, you know, it's just a question I have. Um, and I realize it doesn't have a good answer <laughs> because we're also not, um, you know, wanting a full access driveway here. But that might be something that um, maybe some on site wayfinding signs or something like that could potentially help alleviate. Um, and I'm sure as customers, patron, you know, um, people who are coming here frequently will craft their own ways of getting there. We just hope that they're doing it. I'm not sure what tools we have to make sure that that's happening in a really safe way. Um, what else? Um, I think those were the those were the big ones that I hear um, or questions that I had. And just again, I realized that uh, negotiating with property owners on access like this doesn't always work out. Um, and so I'm happy that in this case it has even in a limited way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Next, who wants to go next? Roger. Um, I, I hate to bring this whole thing up again too because we, we, we rehashed the whole dilemma, but I'm just kind of curious on, on route one right at that, right in front of where your entrance is gonna be, um, I don't recall, is that just concrete divider there? Or it's not raised that much, is it? There's, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing, right? It's It's striped and it starts to basically taper off at that at that point. So theoretically, anybody heading north and wanting to go into the service station can just take a left right to this. Yes. Theoretically. Yeah. And they do, probably. Probably. Okay. Uh, see, that's the problem I have with the whole thing is a lack of consistency. I, I just think there's a fairness thing. It's screwed up, but it's still it's 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 not fair, you know. Um, the other thing you mentioned is you, you are you still talking to the diner people? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of conversations at the very onset of yeah. this project, and those have have kind of gone away since okay. then. Um, right now, this is our focus. Sure. But in the future. You know, this may come up again because of the potential opportunity for that connection. So once Evergreen's in there, and if they find that it's not working, that may come up again. Um, well, I won't dwell on this anymore. I mean, I just, I just feel bad for you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Yeah, sure. I'd like to go next. So we've been through this project a few times and, and we tend to do this. We go through projects and we leave them, they leave here with one task. And this task was to talk to mobile about the emergency entrance for the most part. And then when we come back, when they come back, we give them a hundred more questions about could we do this or can you do that or put another pine tree over there. And I think that that is not beneficial to the applicant or to anybody really. Um, it was my understanding from my reading of the codes for the town that we want to limit access to sites for safety purposes. So to have an access in from the mobile station is, would not be considered a good thing, um, nor would it really be considered to have any more than that one access. That's why we have the rule that they have to have a left in, you know, right in, left out, whatever. I'm sorry, right in and right out. But to ask this applicant at this point to start exploring whether or not we can have more access points to the site isn't really fair. And um, it contrary to our codes and standards for the town. So we, we purposely limit access for safety reasons and for traffic control. 
So um, not exactly sure why. Um, we do have a draft motion. Um, having a lock gate there is the only thing that makes sense to me. I think if you talk to public safety, they would tell you the same thing. Um, and yes, people are going to turn left in that. There's Whole Foods. There's a there's there's sites up and down Route One that have the same configuration because that's what we tell them they need to do. Um, and then we wonder how people are going to get in there going north. They're going to get in there the same way they get in everywhere else. Up Route One, there is a spot where you can make a. Um, if I recall, by the marsh, there's a there's a spot where you can um, reverse direction. Um, I wish I had Google Maps up, but I think there's a spot where the the public safety people sometimes sit, and there's a pumping station. And I think that there may be a reverse direction thing there, but I'm not sure. But yeah, if people are coming going north and they see the credit union and they want to turn in there, they are most likely going to turn into another parking lot and come back around and and turn in. And that's the way it's always, that's, there's not, nothing we're ever going to do about that. As long as they don't make a U-turn um, on Route 1, I don't think they're doing anything illegal. So that's all I have to say. I think it's a good project. I think it's, it's not a great spot for it, but that's not a great spot for anything. So I mean, how often do we go to the credit union? I'm sure there are business people that go every day. I think most of us go, you know, once every couple of weeks, but I'm sure I can find a way to get into that parking lot and get out safely with that one access point. I think driving through the restaurant parking lot or cutting through the mobile, someone would just get killed. So I'm in favor of the one access point, as we've discussed, and I already took up more as much time as everybody else. So on a subject that I shouldn't have taken two minutes on other than to say it's good the way it is. We should approve it. Thank you, Rick. Um, Chad? Uh, <clears throat> again, we've seen this a couple times already. So I think we've pretty much explored all the pieces and yeah, appreciate your efforts with the negotiations here. But uh, other than that, I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you. Rick Meinking. I'll just say that you were you managed to put lipstick on a pig and got it good. Thank you. I think that's the way to go about it. Uh, thank you. I second Rick's comment. Not quite as colorfully, I guess, but um, I just a bit of reflection, and that is in terms of, of how we try to uh, set up accesses and access system so that people are safe. But we can only do as much as is possible. Um, people who want to make a U-turn on Route 1 are going to make a U-turn. And even if there was a giant sign that said no U-turns, people would, there's somebody who would make a U-turn. Um, we cannot stop people from being foolish uh, and not driving appropriately and not following the signs appropriately. I, I think you've done a very good job here uh, getting that emergency access. Uh, I do think now that that's there that a couple of things to do would be to say no parking in that drive area because otherwise people will say, oh good, here's a couple of parking spaces I can pull into. Uh, and perhaps no entry, just to make sure that it's very clear from people who are already in the credit union that that's not an exit. That's not the way they're going to go north. Um, so that sort of signage, I think, would be helpful. I think you have done really great work in, in, getting, that, in getting that done. Saying that, I have a draft motion. <clears throat> I move to approve the project titled Evergreen Credit Union proposed by Evergreen Credit Union as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 8-15-22 with the following findings and conditions. 
findings. The proposal would involve construction of a 3,156 square foot credit union with associated parking and three drive through lanes. The proposal would also involve demolition of an existing two story building, eliminate the existing curb cut and create a new right in right out entrance to to and from route one. Conditions one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall a provide updated plan sets showing the emergency access along the mobile gas station property line to the north. B, provide updated plan sets showing the design of the right in, right out access. C, address the peer engineer review comments in the Woodard and Curran memo dated 8-25-22. D, address the peer traffic engineer review comments in the traffic solutions memo dated 9-16-22. E, provide downstream drainage infrastructure on plans for the connection to the catch basin. This is detailed in the 9-19-22 staff memo. F, provide formal approvals from the Portland Water District and Scarborough Sanitary District. G, pay the traffic impact fees, total $64,696.69. Hikus Parkway at US Route 1, $15,840. Dunstan Corner, $33,648. Oak Hill, $10,570, Payne Road Zone 1, $448.29, Payne Road Zone 2, $1,169.68, Payne Road Zone 3, $1,996.20, Payne Road Zone 5, $1,024.52. H, the applicant shall execute and record a stormwater maintenance agreement with the town. The form of the stormwater maintenance agreement is located in Appendix 1, the Town of Scarborough's Chapter 419 Post-Construction Stormwater Infrastructure Management Ordinance. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Two, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant will provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Three, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. All plan modifications are to be completed prior to scheduling the pre-construction meeting. Four, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall submit evidence in the form of a letter or plan prepared and stamped by a professional engineer who either prepared the post-construction stormwater management plan and its associated facilities, or supervise the plan and facilities construction and implementation. The letter or plan shall certify that the stormwater management facilities have been installed in accordance with the approved post-construction stormwater management plan and that they will function as intended by said plan. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jen, seconded by Jen Ladd. Uh, will you please call the roll? Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Rick Meinke? Yes. Roger Bailey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. And Rick Dupree? Yes. Thank you. And the plan is passed. Thank you. Number 11, next gen Development LLC requests a site plan amendment review to construct a 9,900 square foot two-story mixed-use building on lot 35 in the Innovation District of the Downs. The property is further identified as Assessor's Map U53, lot 35. Eric? Thank you. So next gen is in front of the planning board with a site plan uh, for construction of a 9,900 square foot uh, mixed-use building. Uh, this property is located at the end of Innovation Way at the Innovation District in the Downs, uh, directly adjacent to the IDEX lot that was approved in uh, November or December of last year. Um, the project would include uh, industrial and warehouse incubator type spaces, as well as 22 apartment units on the second floor. Uh, as presented, the residential units will be accessed from the front side of the building, with the commercial uses being accessed from the rear and the private drive. The property previously received site plan approval uh, in December for a 10,000 square foot office in light industrial space, which is no longer being pursued. Uh, 
Staff's main comments revolve around the access to the site and the circulation through it, including delineation of the residential versus commercial spaces. And with that, I turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and for the applicant. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight on behalf of Next Gen Development, LLC. Uh, they are the new lot owners. Uh, as Eric had indicated back at the end of last year, there was a building that was approved on this site. It was a 10,000 square foot, two-story building. If you recall, uh, that building had sort of an upscale office that was two stories on the south end of the building. Uh, and then the north end of the building was a warehouse type area for file storage associated with the office space. Uh, and as Eric mentioned, uh, that project is not moving forward. Uh, the uh, applicant, the prior applicant opted not to, to move forward with the site. So we are here tonight uh, before you with a new building uh, on this property. It is technically an amended site plan because it was approved by you folks uh, back last year. And for Mr. DuPerry, um, which I know he was concerned on, on one of our other prior projects, I've also brought for you a rendering of the oh, site plan. So, for those of you who were on the board at the time of the prior approval, one of the topics uh, that was under great discussion was hey, timing in life is everything. We were before you folks for site plan approval, but at the same time, IDEX was coming forward, but they were at sketch plan review. So there was quite a bit of question about the points of access uh, for IDEX for their site. Uh, as well as the orientation of the points of access for the cul-de-sac, uh, which is now the end of Innovation Way. As part of our prior review, we worked uh, with you folks and with the folks at IDEX to make sure that our point of access to that site was aligned directly opposite the westerly point of access to the IDEX site. That remains when IDEX came through and actually got approved uh, and is now going forward with construction, that uh, entrance did not move. As part of our design of this particular site, we wanted to make sure that we had the current and most up-to-date information. So we reached out uh, to IDEX's engineer and was able to get the final approved plans from you folks um, for that are going to construction on that. So. The entrance location remains directly aligned opposite the westerly entrance to the IDEX site. If you look closely at the site plan that is before you, you'll see the cul-de-sac for Innovation Way. That represents the most recently designed uh, cul-de-sac and approved by the board, uh, as well as the point of access for one of the, uh, what would be the most southerly entrance to the IDEX site off of that cul-de-sac. So, Vehicles coming in, uh, come through the cul-de-sac and uh, pass over a short section of the private way that is located to the east of this site. If you recall in our prior discussions, there, was, uh, there were discussions about using the private way as a point of access for the site. Our concern with that uh, having it being on the northerly end of the site was the proximity to the cul-de-sac. And so we worked to make sure that we had a point of access. It was off Innovation Way, uh, but it is separated from the cul-de-sac. With this building, this is a completely different use in that the first floor of the building has three spaces within it, one large and two somewhat smaller, that are envisioned for a light industrial warehouse type use where very similar to the incubator buildings that are on, uh, the, on the end of Dynamic Drive in the Innovation District. So the south end of this site has overhead doors that provide access to that first floor space. The north end of this building has windows on the, on the north side of those incubator spaces and has stair access points to the second story, which is where we are proposing 22 apartment units, 18 of which are studio apartments. These studio apartments, the range in size from 322 square feet to 326 square feet. 
for a point of reference, that apartment size is roughly 16 feet by 20 feet. Those are the studio apartments. There are four one bedroom apartments and those apartments range in size from 491 to 537 square feet. Not a lot bigger, but somewhat bigger and those each have one bedroom. The remainder of those units are studio apartments. <clears throat> what we wanted to do with this site was to clearly denote the residential portion of the property versus the more commercial or industrial type uh, end of the site. So the parking for the residences, the access to the building, et cetera, is all situated on the northerly end of the site. We have our point of access, as I said, aligned with the westerly entrance to the IDEX site. We also have, if you'll see in the middle uh, there, we have an outdoor gathering space, uh, which would have a pergola over it. I'm going to show you the building elevation here. <clears throat> So what you're seeing in this uh, rendering view is the north and east wall of the building. So you'll see that covered gathering area uh, centrally located on the site. There, the door that shows uh, in that rendered view is the door to access the stairwell to go to the second floor. As I mentioned for um, architectural view purposes. We also have windows on the first floor to balance things out, but the residences are all on the second floor. On the uh, opposite side, if you will, on the easterly side, we also have a stairwell and the mechanical room. So that's the area where um, all of the utilities would come into the building itself. There is one door that does access the first floor uh, of the building as well on that easterly side. Uh, of the building. So switching back to the site for a minute, I'm actually going to use this point, which will allow you to kind of also share a view of the building itself. <laughs> so as part of uh, Eric's introduction, uh, he did indicate that the, the staff had uh, asked us to discuss the points of access to the site and our sort of reasoning and logic behind why and how uh, we have it laid out the way that we do. Uh, and as I mentioned, we've used the building as a demarcation point to separate the residential parking area from the area for the incubator spaces on the first floor. That allows us to have the folks who would be living in the second floor to have their access, their parking, et cetera, um, isolated, if you will, from the truck traffic that may be coming into the IDEX site uh, off the private way. It also allows the traffic uh, that would come into the south side of the site to use that private way as well. So we're not adding a point of access onto the cul-de-sac. We're using the existing one that was approved by IDEX. We are proposing to have our access to the first floor, the more commercialized, if you will, uh, use of the building separated and off that private way. It allows us to uh, get a, a tractor trailer truck into the site. We've provided you folks as part of our package with a vehicle turning maneuver for truck access to the rear of the site. And as I mentioned, there are overhead doors on that side of the building, uh, which will allow access uh, into the spaces uh, on that first floor. <clears throat> We are providing parking in accordance with the ordinance standards that is in your calculated in your packet. And I believe there was one uh, staff memo or peer review member, I guess it was, that indicated that we are proposing slightly more than the ordinance requires with regard to parking. That plan that's circulating around that was the prior approved plan, that was uh, less than what the ordinance required for parking and we asked for a waiver on that. We're not asking for a waiver uh, on parking for this site. And the additional parking that is provided on the south end of the site is based on the tenant's needs uh, for that use of that area. If you notice on the plan, you'll see that a portion of that parking on the southerly side is actually fenced in. 
and that is allowed uh, that is to provide for um, vehicular or small equipment parking in that fenced in area. So those spaces are uh, envisioned to be used uh, for the business that will occupy the majority of the, the first floor space. <clears throat> so um, we are asking for a couple of waivers and those were highlighted in the memoranda uh, that we received or we submitted to you folks. One is on the drive aisle width uh, and that is both in the north and the south side. On the north side, we are proposing uh, to have a 22 foot drive aisle in the parking area. And on the south side of the building, we're proposing a 24 foot uh, drive aisle. That's where the larger vehicles would be maneuvering in and out of the site. <clears throat> we had uh, received a couple of comments with regard to the fire department and wayfinding and making sure that folks who were in the residential portion of the property knew that that was their area. Uh, so we're looking to do perhaps some um, residential scale demarcation signage. Uh, we had noted that generally in our application materials, but that could be done with some pillars or other types of signage information at the entry off of Innovation Way, which clearly denotes that that's for the residential use and uh, with directional signage to direct any folks who would be coming to the first floor of the building to continue around to the south side of the site. The fire department also uh, had made a suggestion that on the northeast corner of the site, uh, the parking for the residential comes fairly close to the sidewalk uh, that is along the private way. And one of the things that they had suggested was to put in an emergency gate in that location and actually allow fire department equipment to exit the site uh, in that location. And we certainly would be open to that notion. We are not proposing that as a full means of access for residents to use, but in an emergency situation or post-emergency situation, if you will, it would allow the truck to exit and go out via the cul-de-sac. So we're certainly open to that. We have proposed two dumpsters on the site, um, one of which is in the fenced in area and would be for the first floor of the building uh, for the more commercial uh, space. And we also have a dumpster for the residences, which is on the easterly side of the site. It has an apron and an access off the private way. That dumpster area uh, is proposed to be screened with the typical screening that's been used in other dumpsters uh, in the uh, Innovation District. Certainly recognizing that it's perhaps in a more visible location, one of the alternatives that we would be proposing for that was to use a more of a solid material that is the same type of material used as the accent panels on the building. So it ties in with the building, it gives it more of a look rather than sort of a, a fenced in dumpster area uh, off to the side. So we certainly would be willing uh, to do that as well. Uh, to update that. So uh, I think I've sort of hit my notes, if you will. I do appreciate the opportunity to, to meet with you folks. Um, we would like to have the opportunity to address the staff comments and we'd be certainly uh, hopeful that you folks would be comfortable enough to provide us uh, an approval conditioned on doing just that. So uh, we're here tonight to answer any questions. We do appreciate your feedback and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Uh, this is subject to public comment. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment on this project? Is there anyone online, Eric? No one online, Madam Chair. In that case, the uh, time for public comment is over. And I turn this over to the board. Let me start at this end with Rick Meinking. Yeah, just looking at the <coughs> metrics here. Um, one of the concerns I have is that dumpster that's in the center there coming off of the private drive. Actually, that is completely dark all the time. So you might want to add some lighting in that area. Um, I think that's the only area there. 
Um, also, <laughs> on your plans, uh, or your plans, I see snow storage for the commercial side, but on the residential lot, I don't see any snow storage. So it'd be interesting to see where you're at. Yeah, I, if I can respond to that one, you're correct. We didn't uh, show that on there. Uh, in working with uh, Keith Smith, our landscape architect, who is here, uh, and I apologize because I had intended to have Keith talk, but I skipped right over that with my apologies. But um, one of the things that we <coughs> saw was the plantings along the north edge of the site have been designed by Keith in order to allow for winter storage. So they're more of the perennials, they're more of the, the hardy plantings that would allow um, to be used for snow storage in the winter. When they die back, the snow banks, if you will, provide that ac extra screening during the winter months. So um, that will be the area that is identified on the plan for snow storage. And I don't believe we allow chain link fences around dumpsters, do we? So we'll have to uh, come back with something a little bit different. As I mentioned um, in the sort of the introduction, one of the things that we'd be proposing for that dumpster in particular uh, is to integrate a uh, panel similar to what's an accent panel on the building itself to actually do a full screen of that one. That yeah. the plane say plane like yes, and that that needs to be updated uh, as part of that. I'll stop there and then. Thank you, Jen. Um. Uh, I my first question is about whether or not there's any opportunity or um, whether or not your team has had conversations previously about the opportunity for any sort of shared use parking here. So typically a residential use and any sort of daytime commercial use, um, unless of course your uh, tenant is a night heavy business, um, but in general, those can often be compatible, um, compatible uses and maybe not one for one, but, you know, a portion. Um, so I'm curious about whether or not that's an opportunity. And then if it is, I, I think um, that could help alleviate, I mean, this is just a super tight site as it's been designed right out to the full property lines on all four corners for grading and landscaping and dumpsters and all the things that you're trying to fit in here. Um, but if there were any opportunity to um, make better use of those parking, shared, shared use parking areas, I just, it, it looks, I could see the, um, the northerly parking lot being very full and busy overnight and the other one being somewhat empty. And then during the day, um, you know, maybe the reverse to a certain extent. Um, that was my first thought about uh, parking. And similarly, um, I think it was uh, mentioned in a staff comment or peer review or something, but I um, saw the, the truck turning exhibits for fire truck and uh, tractor trailer. And what happened was in order to provide that loop and allow maneuvering to have the truck access to the first floor of the building, we ended up in a site that wouldn't meet the applicant's needs for parking for their use on the first floor as well as parking needs for the second floor because it ends up taking up quite an arc. We then looked at the alternative, okay, let's just turn it 90 have parking on either side of the building, very similar to what we have, but a 90 degree orientation. It's a square lot, right? So what happens is we can maintain that point of access on Innovation Way for the residential and come down very similar to what you saw on the plan that was approved uh, last year. What happens is we can't get a truck to do basically what would be a complete turn, almost like a U, coming into the site because they can't come in off another point off Innovation Way. We can't make that maneuver. So from an orientation standpoint and all the needs that we have to meet for the types of combined uses that are on this site, this represented the best alternative. We felt that the building itself provided a good separation. 
we were able to clearly identify the residential points of access and the residential parking are on the north side of the site. On the south side of the site, we're able to keep those trucks down there. They can maneuver in and out uh, and get into the more commercial light industrial type uh, portion of the site. So we did look at the other alternatives. It's not to say that we didn't, but um, this represented the best alternative to meet the needs of the applicant. The crossroads requires that the building uh, in a front lot have a relationship to the street. Uh, by putting two rows of parking in front of the building for the residents, um, you've essentially removed that relationship to the street. We have, um, if you look at the uh, guiding uh, regulating plan for uh, the Innovation District. Uh, we do mm -hmm. have parking cited in accordance with um, what would be a type A front lot, uh, in that there is an allowance to have parking between the street and the building. It's On our particular well. site, that's similar to uh, AV Technic and Throttle also has that type of a layout. The difference that the AV Technic site and the Throttle site have is that they are on a private way in which you can get access to the site. On, in this case, we have the cul-de-sac that's right on the corner, and there is no private way on the easterly, uh, westerly side of the site. So we can't come in with that access through the private way because there isn't one on the, east, on the west side of the site. On the east side of the site, that cul-de-sac coming through, we're not going to be able to have a point of access to this site close to that cul-de-sac. So it forces everything to be able to come in on the southerly end of the site off the private way. And when we do that, then we mix in the residential parking, the commercial parking. And we've, we've looked at different alternatives to try to figure out, well, can you mix them? And what happens is you never get a good separation between the folks who will be living there and wanting to walk to the stairs on either end of the building and the overhead doors that are accessing the first floor spaces. So we felt that this orientation represented that, provided a front lot determination. We are extending the presence of the building with the gathering area uh, for the site to bring that a little bit closer uh, to the site. We have a robust landscape plan along the site frontage in that 10-foot green strip. And we feel that given this particular site's location, we are consistent with that regulating plan for the Innovation District. It's one row of parking. You're comparing it to one row of parking in the access road. Angela, we, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for coming, by the way. <laughs> I, b I believe there's parking right in front of the building and then another, is there not two rows? Uh, it's a double loaded layout. Yeah, so we have essentially two rows. Which is, this is the regulating plan image that I was referring to. Yeah, I, I, I understand. Uh, the board needs to make a judgment as to whether that regulating plan has been met with what you are proposing here. Um, I'm not clear that it has been. The, um, in terms of a chain link fence, chain link fences are allowed, but they must be either painted black or uh, be covered with vinyl. I believe it's a black vinyl coated fence. All right, so that does have that, that yes. coating. Uh, do you have a, arrangements for a knock box, knocks box across uh, where that uh, gate is? There would be one with that gate, yes. Okay. Um, I'm not clear where the area is that's, did you indicate that there's an area covered? The uh, outdoor gathering area has a pergola over it. It's part of the building. No, I'm sorry, on the commercial part, or is it just that? Is it just uh, enclosed? There's no covering? It's fenced in. There's no covering, no. Okay. Okay. 
I get concerned when um, when I hear the well we've got this lot and we've got this building and we have to make it all fit uh, and we've seen that in the past and we're seeing it again um, I, I understand that the, the applicant has needs uh, and wants to try and get everything done in the space that's allotted um, but this development uh, this building troubles me uh, in terms of how it chops the whole lot in half. It really doesn't allow for circulation around it. Um, it has the, I don't believe it has the relationship with the street that's, that's necessary. Uh, and the, it's, it's troubling to me. And I'm, I'm really struggling to see how it meets the ordinances and the requirements, design requirements for the, for the downs. Um, the 22 feet, that's not something we reasonably do. Uh, we traditionally do. It is, and as I said, it's non-precedential. Uh, I, I keep feeling as though what we're seeing is something that's being squeezed in. Uh, and the building is attractive. I like the concept of a mixed use. I'm sure that within a week of the apartments being built, they're going to be filled uh, with people who want to work at IDEX or visit IDEX or rented by IDEX uh, to, to uh, have them available for workers that have to come in for some specific jobs. But it, again, it troubles me. It's too big a building. It's crammed. Uh, the parking, I don't think, is effective. Uh, and I don't think uh, once you eliminate, once you go back up to 24 foot, feet, you're going to have a problem there, or 25 feet. So I don't know what advice to give you. Other than to say, I, I, I have problems trying to to fit uh, to fit this building on this lot. So, um, is there anything else you would like to know from us? Like to be able to have, um, I think, a little bit more definitive direction. I've heard a lot of positive comments about the project. Um, we were hoping to be able to leave here tonight with clear direction on you know, what we need to do to address the plan. And I understand your concerns, Madam Chair, but um, you know, we do have the ability to demonstrate that a vehicle can maneuver in and out of those parking spaces with a 22-foot drive aisle as requested. We also have a trailer truck coming in and out with a 24-foot drive aisle uh, as requested. I know tonight there was a discussion about a similar residential setting in which there was parking on either side of the residential drive aisle that was approved at 20 feet. And so I understand totally about precedent setting, but I'm asking the board to consider the fact that we can demonstrate via vehicle turning maneuvers that a 22 foot drive aisle in this particular setting can work. I'm, Madam Chair, I, yep. I, I'm concerned with emergency vehicle. How's that going to work? Part of the application materials that we provided to you showed the maneuvering of a fire truck into the north end of the site. Uh, the discussion about providing a gated access for vehicles leaving the site uh, is as a result of the discussion and review with the fire department that they'd like to have a gate on the easterly end of the site uh, for them to leave. Uh, but there is a, there is a uh, vehicle turning maneuver for the town's fire truck to come into the site. It's in the application materials. That's the reasoning for the request for a waiver on the drive entry width to 25 feet at the entrance to the site. Can you point me to the, um, the design that shows the tr exit, the emergency exit? Or the exit for the uh, emergency vehicle? The exit for the emergency the, vehicle is a, is a request that came to us in a staff memo. It's not on the plans, but we would provide it. 
Um, so if you look at the uh, northeast corner of the site, you'll see that the turn uh, area for the parking is relatively close to the sidewalk. We would put a gate in that location. We would break that uh, pavement and put ramps in uh, for the sidewalk. It would be flushed and there would be a gate in that location. So a fire truck that came into the site could just go out the exit gate, but not residential, uh, residential vehicles. So that would be a third, third cut. It's a gated access, emergency third, only. But a third cut, It is. Rick, do you have additional questions? No, I'm just, I did find the print, but I still don't understand. You're say, saying that you're going to have a gate on the east end of this? I guess I needed to see it on a print. So a fire truck would come into the site from Innovation Way. Um, that would be the only way a fire truck could get to this site because Innovation Way is a dead end. So the fire truck would enter the site on the uh, west side of the site, come into the northerly parking area, and then the fire department had concerns about their ease of being able to back out after the emergency mm -hmm. uh, and leave the site. So what they had requested was if you look at the east end towards the private way, you'll see that there's a back around for the parking and it gets fairly close to the sidewalk. In that location, we would connect to the private way with a gate that is locked and controlled only by the fire department uh, to provide an opportunity for a fire truck to exit the site after the emergency. Okay. I just didn't see it on the print that way. And how does it? How does the fire truck exit from the back parking lot? I guess that's the south. On the south end, the, the fire truck can back into the area that is extended on the private way, down by where those five parking spaces are, and then drive straight out. So it's backing out. Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask the staff if they have any recommendations uh, and guidance to provide the applicant for their resubmission. Can I just ask a quick question first? Sure. Uh, on the fire truck, because I was a little confused as Rick was. So I, I think I understand it now that, she's, that you've explained it. Um, doesn't the fire truck movement have to be approved at some point by public safety, by the fire department, right? Yeah, they, they generally review the, um, the turning movements that the applicants provide. Okay. Yep. So at some point, um, the applicant's gone over how they propose that it works, and at some point, the um, fire department will look at that, and if it's not okay, they would let us know, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. And they were actually the ones who, as um, several of you have mentioned, have requested the eastern end of the parking lot to connect to that private drive um, as a gated access so that they okay. could get to and through the site. Yeah, I know we were discussing it, and you know, we discuss a lot of things, and it's all important, but I just wanted to so make to my, sure that the fire department is the one who actually makes the decision on okay. So to my understanding, determines whether the truck can be, sorry. As part of that review, um, as part of the staff review that generates the memoranda, the fire department is involved. So they have looked at these plans. They've seen the truck maneuvering um, for the emergency vehicles for the site. And as a result of their review of that information, their one request was to have that connection. There were no comments that we received on the access at the southerly end of the site. Okay. So the, the, the fire department's reviewed it. The one request they made you accommodated, correct? We will, yes. yes. And so the fire department is okay with the movement through this site as it is to proposed, my understanding yes um as it is so the, the fire department looked at it they had one concern you addressed the concern and now the fire department's okay with what you proposed i just wanted to make sure i was clear on that and as a general rule of thumb what we see the fire department asking for and um i don't think i'm giving any away any firefighting secrets with this but uh, access to a short side and a long side of the building 
And I think the uh, innovation drive access provides um, the, the support to the front side of the building and then the private way sh uh, allows them to get to the side of the building. Um, so I think that was sort of where they were comfortable with um, what was provided, uh, especially if the connection's made so a fire truck can get in and out from Innovation Way. But, but not to the uh, fourth side of the building. Right, and we can certainly check in with them on, on that again, um, but um, that's something we can, we can update the board on. Since there's no access for a car to go or a truck to go completely around the building, I have to go back out onto a road up another road and back into another parking lot. So the innovation way, the um, private way access works for the side, one side of the building, but not for the other side. Uh, and with residents, I, since it's a residential um, fire safety and certainly needs to be handled. And Rick, the, uh, See sheet one, turn yeah, simulation. Yeah, I got it now. I see it. Yep, there it is. So, Madam Chair, to your earlier question, um, I'll go first, and then I'm sure everybody else has comments as well. I think that the point that you brought up about the um, the orientation to the street or the relationship with the street, um, to me, this is a I understand the, the intent, but it's somewhat of a back lot in Innovation Way. And the project itself, the architecture, the usage, I think is a good use for this lot. Um, you know, this is the second time they've come to us with a project for this lot. I mean, the first one we approved and unfortunately didn't go. Um, if this one doesn't go and now the Downs and Scarborough have to look for another tenant. And I know it's not the town of Scarborough, but we all benefit when we have a good neighbor. Um, I'm okay with the project and the waivers as it is. And as far as the relationship with the street, I know that, again, I understand the intent, but I think it's a good project and I would be willing to allow it even if it doesn't orient the street as well as maybe some of the other projects have. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Um, I, I think that, um, well, first of all, one of your comments about rationale for orienting the building in this direction, I thought had to do with um, not uh, with better functionality for emergency vehicles to come in and enter the site, so not coming in and dead ending, even though it kind of sounds like that. I think what I'm understanding is that's what the current um, that's what the current plan is. Prior to the comment about the, um, the gated access, um, so I guess I'm 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 still. Um, not entirely sure why a, why a building orientation in the other direction might not work, but that's an aside. The question was about um, the street facing orientation of this building. Um, and I think that there are perhaps a couple of other things that you might be able to consider to improve upon how the building in this location interfaces with the street. So things like you've got this actually tremendous um, outdoor gathering space for residents of the building, but there's no connection to that, uh, or from that to um, the sidewalk infrastructure on Innovation Way, uh, or I say there isn't, you could go a very circuitous route out along the, um, the private way, but it just, it seems like you could really present the front door of this building to the the edge of innovation way with a with a maybe some additional um, landscaping or a, a crosswalk or some benches or something like that um, on the northern side of this parking lot that would kind of create more of a a human scale entrance as opposed to um, just the vehicular entrance that you have currently shown I'm not sure if I'm doing a good job explaining that but um, 
that to me is one way that you know you you could kind of tie this building in its current location, preserve the parking in its uh, as it's shown, but also have a, a stronger presence to the edge of the street, um, in a way that maybe is a nod to the um, the design guidelines here. Um, that was your question. That was my comment. Yeah, if I could follow up on what Jen said, it, it's possible to that enhancing the doors to the upstairs, uh, perhaps double doors um, on both ends, and the striping or some sort of passageway uh, to the road um, might create a much better uh, orientation to the street might might be much more welcoming. Right now, um, as you look at it, uh, while the access for the apartments faces Innovation Way, uh, when when you look at it, there's very little indication that there are apartments there at all. That there's anything welcoming. Um, that the uh, outside pergola that you've set up and with the canopy. Um, could as well be for the employees of the first floor, you know, as as for the apartments. In other words, it's not a coherence that's there. So we can work with the architect to perhaps um, enhance the residential points of access to the building, uh, and then perhaps to provide through a crosswalk um, a connector directly to uh, the sidewalk along Innovation Way, and maybe some benches. Uh, that would flank that in that green strip uh, between the parking and the and, and and that brings that brings the building to the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to go. Anyone else? Any other comments? You got a good sense of where we're going? I do. Um, one last question. Uh, is this something that we could work with staff on? Uh, to be able to finalize it and perhaps get on a consent calendar with you folks. So you'd still have the opportunity if there was something that you had a concern about, but uh, at least we would be able to move forward. The applicant is concerned about winter construction setting in uh, and getting a foundation in uh, before the snow flies. Uh, I'm trying to think of a parliamentary way to do it. Um, Certainly, we recommend that you work with the staff. Uh, and Madam Chair, I yeah, I, I'm trying I to figure out how, how to, how to do it appropriately. I earlier said I was OK with it. Mm -hmm. But if it's going to change, I want to see it again. I, I don't want to drive by there and see something like this. <laughs> what the heck? OK, okay. The, that, that's very helpful, Rick. Um, basically, you're coming back to us again. Work with the staff. Come back to us with something that, that I think you've got a sense of what would make all of us comfortable. And it wouldn't have to be a consent agreement, but it could be. Pa it's possible that working with the staff uh, would bring this to completion for the next meeting, but, but not for a consent, because I think we do need to take a look at it. So if you, can, if you can move fast, then you can get early on the agenda. <laughs> uh, and I believe that's the um, October 11th meeting. And if it's any consolation to you, I will not be here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but neither will Rick Meinking, so just, just so you know. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, Nancy, I really appreciate how you work with us. Appreciate very it. Much. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. Be back. Staff report. Thank you, Madam Chair. All we had today, we did want to um, ask if you all would consider or wanted to consider moving your October 31st meeting to November 1st. Uh, October 31st, of course, is Halloween, and I'm not sure how many of you that affects, but it was a request that was brought up by some applicants, and so we thought we'd put it, push it forward. 
I'm, I'm already aware of uh, a couple of people who are planning on taking their kids uh, out for Halloween and would have to come in costume. Uh, so um, I have no problem. Anybody else got a problem moving it to a Tuesday? I would prefer to move it to a Tuesday. I don't want to be here on Halloween. I've got grandkids. So. You could get your costume on. <laughs> I could come in costume. <laughs> okay. It is a non-costume meeting on November 1st. On November 1st. Thank you. And then um, the only other thing we wanted to mention, we are working on the New Year's calendars, and so we'll bring those back uh, November 21st for you all for next year. Thank you. Uh, uh, before we finish on the... Before we finish on the staff report, I just wanted to um, take a quick poll just to make sure uh, for Wednesday that we'll have a quorum. Um, as you folks probably know, uh, the town council is holding a joint hearing with the planning board on two contract zone proposals. So is there anybody who cannot make that at 530 on Wednesday? I'm not 100 percent. It's at 530, right? Yep. So I'm not 100 percent sure that I can make it because I'm somewhat of a not on call, but. Right. You know, if the lights go out here, I won't be here because I'll be trying to get your lights back on. So yeah. if, if the lights go out here, we will not be here either. <laughs> we've, got, we've got like a twenty forty thousand dollar generator okay. over here. Twenty forty. OK, uh, let me uh, uh, let me ask Chad, are you going to be able to be here? Uh, no, I have a conflict of interest and as well. OK, as traveling. Uh, we only need four board members. One, two, three, four. I'll be here Wednesday. Roger, Jen. So we'll have a quorum. We have a quorum. Great, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? The next meeting, are you guys going to go through the whole week? Or? Yeah, congratulations. You, you get to run the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, I was going to wait, but you know, it came up. Um, administrative amendment report. None at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Minor development reviews. Uh, we have a few in the pipeline, but none at this moment. Thank you. Uh, correspondence. Um, we received the letter from uh, Andrew Mackey from the uh, Scarborough Land Trust requesting that um, the recreational fee uh, be directed to the Scarborough Land Trust. To the best of my knowledge, we cannot do that. That is not within our authority to do. Um, the, about the only thing we can do with a recreational fee is if a developer shows us that the developer has uh, enough amenities and recreation on the site, the developer can ask to be uh, to, for a waiver of the fee. I recall that happening a couple of times, and I actually don't recall that we actually waive the fee. This is money that belongs to the town of Scarborough. Uh, it goes into a budget. We have no say over, uh, we can't sequester any part of a budget uh, for the town, and we cannot direct uh, any of a town's money to a, a private um, a private organization as wonderful as the the land trust is uh, uh, this it's not in our purview thank you unless somebody wants to argue with me <laughs> okay um, so uh, Erica Autumn could you please send a, a note to Andrew that we've had this discussion. We don't believe it's something that's uh, within our authority to do. Certainly. Thank you. Planning board comments. Anyone? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Yes, you do. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. I've heard that. All in favor? Uh, just raise your hands, wave a little yeah, bit. You Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>